Hello everyone, thank you for attending this uh, tutorial on rate splitting. My name is Bruno Clerks, I'm an academic at Imperial College London in the Department of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. Uh, this is my web page with a lot of um, information. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions on this tutorial. So the content of this tutorial is as follows. We'll look at eight different uh, sections. So we'll start with uh, an introduction to MIMO networks, trying to understand the main building blocks of uh, MIMO networks. Then we'll look at uh, the motivations behind a new physical layer based on the use of rate splitting. And we'll look at two motivations. The first one will be on multi-antenna, multi-user communications with imperfect channel state information, the transmitter. And the second one will be on how to uh, bridge and unify various multiple access schemes into a single one that is called rate splitting multiple access. And so in part three and part four, we we'll look at those two motivations in more detail. In uh, section five, we we'll look at uh, pre-coder optimization, how we can optimize uh, rate splitting schemes. In section six, we we'll look at physical layer design, modulation, coding, um, and link level simulations of rate splitting. And section seven, we'll talk about uh, numerous applications of rate splitting in very uh, different um, emerging scenarios that we have in 5G and we'll have in 6G as well. And finally, we'll conclude, look at future changes and then talk about uh, standardization and pathway to 6G. So um, let's remind us what MIMO networks are. I will talk about point-to-point -point MIMO, multi-user MIMO, multi-cell MIMO and uh, massive MIMO. And this will be relatively brief, it's just that we have a uh, good uh, understanding of basic terminologies. Right, so MIMO refers to multiple inputs, multiple outputs. We have here in this example, a scenario where we have M transmit and N receive antennas. So in this setup here, we have two transmit antennas and two receive antennas. And a particular case of MIMO, we have MISO, multiple input, single output, where we have multiple transmit antenna, single receive antenna, or SIMO, where we have single transmit and multiple receive antennas. And SISO, the simplest case, where we have a single input, single output, so single transmit and single receive antennas. Now, what, is, what are the benefits of MIMO? The main benefits of having multiple transmit and receive antennas um, is the multiplexing gain that is also called degrees of freedom. And this is a terminology that we'll see extensively in this tutorial. And so what does multiplexing gain or DOF refers to is essentially the slope of the rate or the achievable rate versus the SNR. And it uh, reflects the number of interference free streams that can be transmitted in these point-to-point uh, -point MIMO channels. And um, Mathematically, it can be expressed as follows. We have a rate, achievable rate, and at high SNR, it can be approximated as GS, or multiplexing gain, multiplied by log two uh, SNR. So this is actually our SNR in dB, and GS is our pre-log factor of the rate, and so GS is our degrees of freedom. And so for point-to-point -point systems, we know that the degree, degrees of freedom is smaller or equal to the minimum between the number of transmit and receive antennas. And so how can we achieve this uh, in point-to-point -point systems is by using spatial multiplexing schemes when we don't have a channel state information transmitter. And when we have channel state information transmitter, we can use multiple egg and mode transmission based on an SVD or singular value decomposition of the MIMO channels and then perform a water filling power location. Now, what is interesting in point-to-point -point, uh, MIMO channels is actually the DOF is actually resilience to channel state information uh, inaccuracies at the transmitter. So whether we have uh, channel state information the transmitter or no channel state information at the transmitter, the maximum DOF we can achieve is still equal to the minimum between M and N. So this resilience to 
uh, CSIT in accuracy we see is this is holds for point-to-point uh, -point MIMO chance. It doesn't hold in um, in multi-user scenario. Okay, so multi-user MIMO is refers to the fact that now those um, those wireless networks actually are um, naturally multi-users. So we have multiple users that have to be served in those multi-antenna networks. And the question is how to deal with those users. We can have general K users. And how can we use MIMO or multi-antenna uh, processing to um, serve those uh, multiple users? And so there are typically two uh, important scenarios. Uh, we have the multi-antenna or MIMO broadcast channels, which is representative of a downlink scenario in the cellular systems. And we have the multiple access channel that is representative of the uplink of the communication systems. Right, so here is an example of the downlink. We have multi, uh, a transmitter, a base station, for instance, equipped with multiple transmitter antennas, and it wants to serve multiple users here on the same time and frequency resource um, using uh, multi-antenna processing. And here on the uplink is the opposite. We have multiple users who want to actually transmit data to one receiver. And in general, all those nodes could have uh, multiple antennas. Right. So in this tutorial, we'll focus on the downlink setting. We'll look at these uh, broadcast channels. And so we often will be talking about um, multi-antenna broadcast channels or uh, MISO broadcast channels. So when we have multiple antennas at the transmitter and single antenna at the receiver, we can have MIMO broadcast channels, the most general case where you have multiple antennas at the transmitters and the receivers. Okay, so um, the if we look at um, these broadcast channels, what we have is that when we serve multiple users, essentially we have a trade-off between the rate that can be achieved by user, a given users versus the rate achieved by other users. And this is characterized by a rate region. And this is an example here of a rate region for a two user scenario in a broadcast channels where we have the rate of user one, the rate of user two, and then we have this boundary here yeah, that is characterized this the boundary of this rate region and what we would like to to do essentially evolve at on this boundary point here um, and so there is a trade-off bet between rate of user one and rate of user two obviously because i can favor more the rate of user one and then user two will actually achieve a low rate or can um, increase the rate of user two but then uh, the rate of user one will be uh, will have to to decrease and so this trade-off depends on um, what kind of systems we have. We could have a SISO, single input, single output broadcast channel. So we have single antenna nodes at both the transmitters and the receivers. And this scenario is very well understood in the literature for, for, uh, for a very long time. And the key in that scenario is actually the users can be ordered according to the channel strength. So the channels are modeled as just complex scalars. Um, and so the magnitude of that complex scalars represent the strength of that uh, channels. And we know that if we can order those channels, we can use superposition coding with successive interference cancellation to achieve the optimal rate regions, or in other words, to achieve the capacity region of this SISO uh, broadcast channel. Um, another strategy is dirty paper coding that um, can also be used in, in the single antenna broadcast channels. It's a different strategy than the superposition coding with SIC that relies more on the transmitter side interference cancellation instead of doing a receiver side interference cancellation as we do in uh, superposition coding with, with SIC. Now, um, uh, a new name for superposition coding with SIC is, uh, is nowadays uh, NORMA. So non orthogonal multiple access, essentially the same thing, but under a different terminology. Now, if we move to multiple antenna scenarios, we have MISO broadcast channels or MIMO broadcast channels. And the issue here is that the users cannot be ordered anymore. We don't deal with, um, with scalars, we deal with vectors or with matrices. And so we cannot order simply the different 
users. And that's the reason why um, the use of superposition coding with SIC or NORMA leads to a performance loss and is not the optimal strategy. The optimal strategy is when we have perfection state information and transmitter is the use of dirty paper coding. And this is known to achieve the capacity region. Now, in practice, dirty paper coding is, is quite complicated to implement. And so what is, has been used um, in the past uh, 15 years or so is the use of um, multi-user linear precoding um, that achieves relatively good performance, but is of uh, much lower complexity. So quick reminder about multi-user linear precoding, which is the building block of uh, many different um, schemes that we have in 4G and 5G. Uh, the main idea is to essentially to multiplex user in the spatial domain. Um, and this is what we find in space division multiple access or SDMA. This is what you can find in multi-user MIMO, in network MIMO, in millimeter wave MIMO, in massive MIMO. And so essentially what we have here is a transmitter or a base station equipped with multiple antennas and we pre-code linearly pre-code the, uh, the, the different streams intended to different users. And those pre-coders essentially create beams that we can see here in these figures. And each beam is intended to one user. And at the receiver, what we do is that any residual interference that the users experience is treated as noise. So this leads to very simple uh, receiver design. On the other hand, the uh, superposition coding with SIC, or nowadays NORMA, non optimal multiple access, um, use the power domain to break the, the orthogonality between, between uh, the orthogonality. So classically, um, we had schemes or multiple access based on um, FDMA, frequency division multiple access, and TDMA, time division multiple access that relies on orthogonality in the time domain or in the frequency domain. Here we're going to use the power domain um, instead of breaking this or to break this orthogonality. And so how to do that is by using superposition coding with SIC. And this is an example of a scenario here. We have a SISO broadcast channel. We have at the transmitter, we superpose the message of two users in the power domain. And then at the receiver, those two receivers here sees those two messages that have been transmitted in the power domain. And so we have one strong user here and one weak user here. The strong user has a stronger channels than the weak user. And so what we do here is that user one that is strong, what he does first is he decodes the message of the weaker user. So he decodes the message of the weaker users and then uh, perform a successive interference cancellation. And finally, he uh, decode his own message. The weaker user, on the other hand, sees the interference from the strong users. And what he does, he treat that interference as nodes. Okay. So the important uh, bit here to understand is that this is based on a strategy that fully decode interference. Indeed, because user one, the strong user, what it does is try to fully decode the message of the weaker user before decoding its own message, which is a very different strategy from uh, SDMA that we had earlier on, where all users treat any residual interference as nodes. So moving on to uh, more general scenarios where we have multiple cells, um, we have um, the question is how to make use of those multiple antennas in um, to manage interference, not only in its cells, but also across cells. And there, there are multiple techniques that exist, coordinations and cooperations. Coordination is when you don't have data sharing across those uh, different uh, transmitters. You only have uh, channel state information sharing and you design or power controls of informer to try to manage the interference between uh, the cells. Cooperation is when you do joint transmission or network MIMO and you see all those different antennas in those different cells as a giant MIMO array. And so you make use of all those antennas jointly to form a uh, giant uh, multi-antenna broadcast channel. And finally, massive MIMO. 
here, a massive MIMO is essentially um, um, an upscaled version of the uh, multi-user MIMO, an upscaled version of this uh, multi-antenna broadcast channels when we have a very large number of antennas at the base station. And this enables to create very, very narrow beams um, and so potentially reduce the multi-user interference if we have uh, good knowledge of the channel state information at the transmitter and lead to some uh, very simple architectures in terms of precoder design. We don't need to have fancy uh, precoder design to manage interference uh, uh, very efficiently. We can use simple match beam former um, that works really well in the limits of having a large number of, of antennas. Um, but as as similar to all the previous MIMO schemes I mentioned, multi-user MIMO, um, multi-cell MIMO, well, massive MIMO actually also relies heavily on channel state information at the transmitter in order to do those recording and the interference management. So let's now start section two on um, the motivation for a new physical layer design based on weight splitting. We look at two motivations. The first one is the problem of imperfect channel state information of the transmitter and how rate splitting can solve that problem. The second one is how to unify various uh, multiple access schemes and to, um, into one single uh, framework based on the so-called rate splitting multiple access. And the last part that will give you a flavor of what rate splitting is by looking at a two user uh, toy example. So the first motivation is about imperfect channel state information the transmitter. All the different multi-user MIMO schemes or scenarios that I have uh, mentioned earlier on like um, uh, multi-user MIMO or multi-antenna broadcast channels, the uh, multi-cell MIMO scenarios, the massive MIMO, they all heavily rely on channel state information and transmitter. And so looking at this example here in this figure, we have a MISO broadcast channels, we have a base station with multiple transmit antennas, we have single antenna uh, users, and so we have vector channels H1 to HK, um, and what the transmitter knows, what the base station knows, uh, is not necessarily those through channels H1 to HK, but uh, estimates. What he knows are estimates of H1 to HK. And so why does the base station knows only estimates of the channel state information? Is because there are many sources of impairment. For instance, quantization error on the feedback link, estimation errors, um, delays and mobility, channel acquisition at the resource block level or subband level and any hardware impairment like phase noise, uh, RF impairments and calibration of RF chains that could be imperfect. All those different source of impairment leads to having the transmitter um, knowing only partially or imperfectly the channel state information of the users. Okay, so looking at the conventional strategies that, um, that is called multi-user linear precoding, um, and that is heavily using multi-user MIMO in uh, multi-cell MIMO in uh, SDMA, um, massive MIMO and millimeter wave MIMO. Um, so how does it work? Uh, we have essentially, we scale K users, um, and we want to transmit K messages to those K users. So at the receiver here, we have K users, user one to user K, and a message W1 is entered to user one, message WK to user K, and so on. So we encode independently those K messages into K streams, and then we linearly precode them across those NT transmit antennas. And the receiver, what we'll do, the receiver K, for instance, will try to uh, recover its message WK by treating any residual interference uh, as noise. So what this, the transmitter strategy is here is essentially linear precoding. Our transmit signal vector X is a sum over K, because we have K users, of the uh, streams of user K multiplied by the precoder of user K. Right? So, importantly, 
we have k messages here and we create k strings. Now these strategies, the issue with this is actually we experience a significant loss if any multi-user interference here among those streams is not within the noise level. And this is what we can see here in this uh, illustration. We have multi-user linear precoding with quantized feedback. So we have those different CSI of the different uh, users that are quantized and reported back to the transmitter. And what we see here is that if we have perfect channel state information in the transmitter, well, the sum rate increases rapidly with the SNR. If we have quantized feedback, well, we have actually the sum rate saturates at, uh, at high SNR. And so this is uh, uh, every lines here correspond to a fixed number of quantization bits. So for instance, here we can have uh, two bits, three bits, four bits of feedback. And what we see, what is important is actually because we transmit with a fixed number of bits of feedback, essentially the sum rate sets rates at high SNR. So this is a very typical problem is known for a long time. And this is what we experience in 4G and 5G systems, simply because the number of bits of feedback is fixed, whatever the SNR. And so this saturation occurs because of multi-user interference that, uh, that cannot be avoided because of the imperfect channel state information at the transmitter. Okay, so if we, if we uh, take some distance with respect to this past literature, we can contrast what uh, the community has been doing in the past 20 years um, with, um, with some new results that have appeared in the information theoretic literature. So in the past 20 years, this is what the community has been doing, and this is how 4G and 5G uh, system have been, have been essentially designed. We start with an information theoretic channel, for instance, a MISO broadcast channels. We try to characterize the capacity region. And so when we have perfect CSIT, this capacity region is known assuming we have uh, the Gaussian, the Gaussian multi-antenna broadcast channels. Um, we try to identify the communication schemes that achieve this capacity region and the communication scheme that this capacity achieving is dirty paper coding. And then we say, well, this is complicated to implement. So let's look at lower complexity strategies, for instance, based on linear precoding and let's optimize those precoders. And then at the end, we realized actually, well, um, the CSI is actually imperfect. And so we incorporate imperfect CSIT into the uh, optimization. But the system model that we started with, um, essentially, or the system model that we, we obtain from, from, from this procedure is the following. We have essentially the transmit signal vector is a sum over the K messages or the K stream that we want to transmit. And each stream is precoded by a precoder PK. Now, this approach is fundamentally motivated by having perfect CSI at the transmitter to start with. So what we're going to do now is try to understand how we can bring this imperfect CSIT into the very beginning. And so this leads to the um, trying to understand what are the fundamental limits from an information theory of multi-antenna broadcast channels with imperfect CSIT. Then understand those limits and try to find the capacity region. Unfortunately, this is an unknown problem information theory for a very long time. And so um, researchers have tried to look at alternative uh, metrics to try to characterize the fundamental limits. And one of them is degrees of freedom region. So try to understand what are the optimal degrees of freedom when we have a MISO broadcast channels with imperfect insight. And now the schemes that achieve these optimal degrees of freedom turns out to be rate splitting. And so once we have this rate splitting framework, then we can do some form of signal processing or precoder optimization. And the system model that we start playing with is the following one, the transmit signal vector is equal to uh, a first stream SC multiplied by a precoder PC, plus a second part here that is reminiscent to what we had uh, in the conventional approach. So what we see is that we have additionally one more stream that is transmitted here. Now this approach that is based on rate splitting is not optimal from a DOF sense. Now, if we look at the problem slightly differently, we can we can notice the following. 
imperfect CSIT is actually a more general problem than perfect CSIT, right? Because if we fix any form of errors to zero, essentially the imperfect CSIT boils down to perfect CSIT. So it makes sense that a solution to tackle the imperfect CSIT is actually should be a more should lead to a more general class of strategies. And this is what we're going to see in this tutorial. This more general class of strategies is based on rate splitting. And we can have different form of rate splitting based on linear pre-coded rate splitting, which is the main one we're going to look at. But we could have some other forms based on non-linear pre-coded rate splitting, for instance, dirty paper coded rate splitting. Now, what is interesting is actually all the conventional strategies we are aware of actually sub strategies of this more general rate splitting framework. And we can see this from those two equations. If I turn off this, this stream here, essentially if I do not allocate any power to these streams, I end up with the conventional um, framework. Right, so what I will show you here in this tutorial is the whole rate splitting is actually an enabler of a very general class of communication strategies. Okay, moving on to the second motivation of the use of rate splitting is the fact that rate splitting is an enabler of uh, general and flexible multiple access strategies called rate splitting multiple access or in short RSMA. And so what we'll see here is that space division multiple access, orthogonal uh, multiple access, non-orthogonal multiple access, and multicasting are all sub-strategies of a marginal framework that is uh, the rate splitting multiple access. And so what we will show is that um, SDMA, which fully treats any residual interference uh, as noise, and NOMA, which fully decode and cancel interference created by weaker users, those two multiple access schemes that appear uh, very different from each other are actually two subsets of a more general class of multiple access that is called rate splitting multiple access. And the key of rate splitting multiple access is not to fully treat interference as noise, is not to fully decode interference, is to partially decode interference and partially treat interference as noise. And so by adjusting how much we want to decode, how much we want to treat as noise, we can bridge the two extreme of space division multiple access and non-orthogonal multiple access. So let's look at um, a toy example of rate splitting in order to understand this uh, basic uh, building block. So this is the architecture of a two user rate splitting. When we have two transmit antennas, in this example, and we have two users, we have a user one and we have a user two. And so what we do at the transmitter, we, we split the message that we want to transmit to user one and user two, we split each of those messages into two parts. So the message of user one and the message of the user two are split into two parts. The first part that is called common and a second part that is called private. And so this is what we see here. W1 in blue is split into a first part, the common one here, and a second part that is called private. Similarly for W2 is split into a common part WC2 and a private part WP2. Then we combine those two common parts into a common message WC, and we then encode those three messages here into three streams. SC, that is a common stream, S1, that is the private stream for user one, S2, the private stream of user two. So what we see, and in contrast to SDMA, we have now that from two messages here, we create three streams, right? In SDMA, from two messages, we actually created two streams. Here, from two messages, we actually create three streams. And so what do we do at the receiver? We actually first, each user first decode the common message. So if we decode first the common streams, try to retrieve this common message, and then user one from this common message will retrieve the part that is intended to itself. So user one from the estimate of the common message will retrieve its common part. Then it will perform successive interference cancellation and will 
decode its uh, private parts. And from the common part and the private part, it will recombine them and reconstruct the original message. Right? So importantly, both users here, user one and user two, both users decode the common stream first and then decode their respective private streams. Now, why is this called rate splitting? It's because the rate of a given user, the okay, rate of user K, is equal to the sum of two rates, is the rate of a private stream, so the rate of uh, SK, the private stream of user K, plus part of the rate of the common streams. And why is it so? It's because the common stream can carry information for user one and potentially for user two. So the rate of user one will be the rate of stream of user one, the private stream of user one, and part of the rate at the common streams that carries the, the part that is intended to user one. So what is important in this strategy is to allocate the power between the common stream and the private stream such that the residual interference among the private stream is within the noise level. And this is key to um, get uh, significant performance enhancement. So let's look at this architecture slightly differently. Um, so we have the same architecture here and we have a transmitter and the receiver. So again, the transmitter, what it does, it takes the two messages, W1 and W2, W1 intended to use a one, W2 intended to use a two, and it split W1 into two parts, it split W2 into two parts. It takes the, the common part of W1, it takes the common part of W2, and it takes them together and it encode them into a common stream. It takes the private part of W1, it takes the private part of W2, and encode into two private streams, S1 and S2. And then those three streams are linearly precoded, and so we end up with a transmit signal um, model that is the common streams multiplied by its precoder, the private stream of user one multiplied by its precoder, the private streams of user two multiplied by its precoder. Again, we go from two messages to three streams. And at the receiver, both users first decode the common streams by treating the private stream as nodes. Then they perform SIC, they remove the common streams, and the user one will retrieve its private stream S1, and user two will retrieve its private stream S2. And then each user will um, extract the common, uh, its common part from the common streams, will extract its private part, and then will recombine those two into the uh, into a message and hopefully this message will be the same as the originally transmitted message. Right, so here SIC is performed, other methods can be used, join decoding, SIC is, is performed to separate uh, at the receiver the common streams and the private streams. So where is uh, multi-user linear precoding or SDMA in this architecture and where is NOMA? Well, we can see SDMA is simply obtained by allocating no power to the common stream. So if I turn off that stream here and I only keep those two, I will end up with the SDMA architecture. And so what will happen is that all message W1 will be encoded into S1 Message W2 will be entirely encoded into S2. There won't be any power located to this common stream. And so what we end up with is actually just P1S1 plus P2S2. The power allocated to the common stream is simply set to zero. And so the entire message W1 and W2 are directly encoded into the private streams. Where is NOMA? Well, NOMA is obtained by forcing a strong user, let's say one of the two users, to fully decode the message of another user. So let's imagine here that user one fully decodes the message of user two. So how this architecture boils down to NOMA? Well, simply by noticing that if uh, user one decodes the message of user two, it means actually both users will actually decode the message of user two. So user two will decode his own message, but user one will also decode his own message. So Said differently, the message of user two is actually uh, the common message in NOMA. And so W2 is actually encoded into the common stream. 
And so this is what's happening. We do not allocate any power to the second private streams, but what we do is that we encode W1 into S1 and we encode W2 into SC. We encode W2 into the common streams. So we encode W1 into a private stream S1. We encode W2 into a common stream SC, such that this common stream can be decoded by both users. And so our system model is simply equal to the following. We have a common stream SC multiplied by a precoder BC. That common stream carries entirely the message of the weaker user W2. And we have a private stream S1 multiplied by its precoder P1, and S1 carries entirely the message of W1. So seen differently, the difference between SDMA, NOMA, OMA, um, multicast, and rate splitting is how messages are mapped into streams. And so if we look at SDMA, we have two messages, W1 and W2. Those two messages are mapped into a stream S1 and a stream S2, two private streams. And among those streams, um, what, what we do, any form of residual interference among those streams is simply treated as nodes. So S1 will be decoded by receiver 1, S2 will be decoded by receiver 2, and any multi-user interference between those two streams will be uh, um, um, treated as nodes. We do not allocate any uh, information or map any information into the common streams when we perform STMA. In NOMA, on the other hand, we allocate the message of the strong users to S1. We do not transmit anything into the second private streams, and we allocate the message of the, we map the message of the weaker user into the common stream so that that message can be decoded by both users. When we do OMA, essentially we orthogonal multiple access, we only transmit to one user at a time or, or in frequency. So we have transmission in orthogonal resources. And so we transmit um, the message of W1 and we do not transmit the message of W2. Multicasting is when we do not allocate, uh, map any information into those private stream, but we put the entire message into the common stream so that both users will uh, uh, decode um, W1 and W2, and both users will retrieve their respective messages. And what we do with rate splitting, we split those two messages such that part of the message of W1 goes into the private stream S1, part of the message of W1 goes into the common streams, part of the message of W2 goes into the private stream S2, and part of his message goes into the common streams. And so by doing this, what we see is that we have the right column here in red is this uh, stream is decoded by both users. In blue here, we we treat any residual interference between those two streams as noise. And so what rate splitting does, it partially treat interference as noise and partially decode interference. In contrast with NOMA, that fully decode the interference, it fully decode the message of user two before decoding message of user one. And in contrast to SDMA, that does not decode any information, does not decode any interference, but any treat any residual interference between those two streams as nodes. And so by adjusting how much we put into the private streams, those two private streams, and how much we put into the two common, the, the common streams, essentially we can adjust and rate splitting can boil down to SDMA, NOMA, OMA, or multicasting, or end up with a scheme that actually is, uh, is different from any of those four sub-schemes. So this shows actually that rate splitting is a general framework uh, that includes those four sub-strategies. So let's look at an example of rate splitting. How does it work at, at, the, at the message level and how we split this? So we keep the same two user rate splitting uh, architectures. We have a user one and user two, and we have a user one message that here, for instance, is made of four bits, and user two message that is made of three bits. And so the user one message is chosen is in a message uh, set here that, for instance, in this example, has uh, 16 elements. The message of user two is chosen in the message set that has eight elements in these examples. And so at the transmitter, 
instead of transmitting W1 and W2 and mapping them directly into stream S1 and stream S2, for instance, as we would do in SDMA or, or multi-user linear recording, what we do in rate splitting, we split the message W1 into two parts. So for instance, the first two bits goes into a common part, into the common part. Um, the last two bits goes into the private part. Similarly for user two, for instance, the first bit of uh, W2 goes into the common part and the last two bits goes into the private part. Then I take the common part of W1, I take the common part of W2, I combine them together into a common message that is now equal to A1, A2, the part coming from user one, and B1, the part coming from user two. And this now message will be encoded into a common streams this part here, private part of user one, will be encoded into private stream S1, and this part here, WP2, will be encoded into the private stream of user two. Let's now move to the next section, where we'll look at um, the, this first motivation to study rate splitting by investigating uh, multi-antenna broadcasters with imperfect CSLT. So we'll introduce a system model and first look at um, perfect CSLT, just to get a grasp of what performance we can have with perfect CSLT. Then um, look into perf imperfect CSLT and see the performance degradation that is due to imperfect CSLT. And then we'll jump into uh, understanding how we can actually use rate splitting strategy to boost the performance under imperfect CSIT scenarios. Um, we look at degrees of freedom, optimality of rate splitting, and illustrate um, the rate uh, enhancement that are offered by offered by um, rate splitting. So this is the scenario we will uh, look at. We have a transmitter with multiple antennas. We have multiple receivers. The receivers in general could have single or multiple antennas. In this scenario, in this setup here, we'll take the, the, the simplest scenario where each receiver has a single antenna. So we'll have a receive observation at user K is a scalar because the receiver has a single receive antennas. We have um, um, the vector channels HK and then we have a transmit signal vector X plus uh, AWGN nodes. We'll assume we have M transmit antennas, K single antenna users, M um, will be chosen larger than K in this uh, section. And so the channel state information is given by those K vectors H1 to HK that will be denoted in the matrix form as uh, uh, matrix H, and um, when we have, when the transmitter um, acquired the estimate of H, we will denote this using a hat, so the transmitter has uh, an estimate of, of H through uh, H hat. So looking at the conventional strategy, which is this multi-user linear precoding, we encode uh, K independent uh, uh, messages into K streams, S1 to SK. Um, and we pre-code the, each of those streams using a precoder P1 to PK, where we normalize the power of each stream, S1 to HK, such that it's equal to one. And so the power allocated to each stream is actually reflected in the norm of the precoder P1 to PK. So we fix a total transmit power constraint equal to P, and this power constraint is given by the sum of the, the square of the norm of each of those precoder P1 to PK. And so what we need to do at the transmitter is essentially to uh, design the precoders according to the estimate of the channels that we have at the transmitter. So typically the precoder at the transmitter, the matrix of the precoder is designed based on the estimate of the channels at time one. And then if the channels change, the precoder is changed and 
designed accordingly as a function of the new estimate of the channel. Right, so if uh, if we uh, um, express the or elaborate further on the received signal here using the system model of linear recording, what we have is that the received observation now is equal to a desired signal plus an interference term plus the noise. And so the desired signals at user k is equal to sk multiplied by pk, and this is received through the channel vector hk. And user k also see interference from the k minus one um, um, co-scheduled uh, streams. And so interference coming from all the streams different than k. And this is what we see here on this figure. We have the receiver one will receive is symbol stream S1 through this uh, pre-coded uh, channel here but we'll also see interference from symbol S2 all the way to symbol SK. And so the instantaneous SINR at the receiver here for user K is given by the power of the desired uh, signal here given by HKPK divided by the sum of the noise power sigma n square and the power of the interference term, so the power of this term which is given here the denominator. And so the intense instantaneous rate is given by log to one plus SINR, assuming we have uh, infinite block lengths and Gaussian inputs. If we have the opportunities to encode over many realization of the channel, we can look at ergodic rates. And so this is essentially the expectation now of the rate um, over the fading process. Good. So let's look at uh, perfect CSIT first. So if we have perfect CSIT, things are very easy because we can simply design those precoders, linear precoder, to fully eliminate the multi-user interference. Um, and how can we do this? Well, if now we have perfect CSIT, it means actually our estimate of the chance known at the transmitter is equal to the true channel, and we can simply do a channel inversion, um, a zero forcing precoder that aims at forcing any multi-user to be equal to zero. Now, instead of having uh, interference term as we had in the previous figure here, and now by using uh, zero forcing beam forming, essentially all the multi-user interference terms are gone. And so symbol S1 is delivered to receiver one without creating any interference to the other receivers. And so the received observation as user K is simply equal to its desired signals plus some noise, and the interference has completely disappeared. What does that mean? It means actually each symbol is delivered to each receiver interference free. Um, and so that means in terms of degrees of freedom, it means actually each user receive one full degrees of freedom. It means that the pre log factor of the rate for each user is equal to one. Right, so how do we define degrees of freedom again? Is uh, the pre log factor of the rate, or more generally speaking, the fraction of an interference free streams that is delivered to the receiver in the limit of uh, high SNR. And so mathematically, this can be expressed as follows. The degrees of freedom for user K is the ratio between its ergodic rate and the SNR in dB. And we look at this when the SNR grows to uh, infinity. And so if each user can achieve uh, degrees of freedom of one, the sum degrees of freedom that is achieved here in this setup when we have perfect CSIT is the sum of the degrees of freedom of user one to k and is equal to k. So in other words, it means that the sum rate of these multi-antenna broadcast channels with perfect CSIT will scale um, um, with as k log SNR. And so the slope of the sum rate will be equal to k. And this is what we see here in this figure. This is a sum rate, this is the SNR. We have three different curves here reflecting three different scenarios when we have two users and two transmitted antennas 
four users and four transmitted antennas, eight users and eight transmitted antennas. And we see that actually the slope is increasing as the number of users and the number of transmitted antenna increases, reflecting this increase in the degrees of freedom. So the slope of that curve here is equal to two, the slope is here equal to four, the slope here is equal to eight. In other words, if we increase the SNR by three dB, the sum rate here will increase by two bits per second per hertz. If we increase by three dB, the sum rate will increase by four bits per second per hertz, and so on. Now, moving on to imperfect CSIT, what happens if the, the channels that actually the transmitter knows is not exactly the one, the true channel? So what the transmitter knows is the estimate of the channels H hat. And this estimate is not necessarily equal to the true uh, channel state information. And so how we're going to model this is by saying that we have an error on the estimate that is H tilde here. And we're going to model H tilde by saying that the variance of this um, error estimate is uh, modeled as something like this, where P is our SNR. And we say that the error power um, scales as p to the power minus alpha k. So alpha k is a parameter that will indicate the um, inaccuracy in the CSI estimate. Assuming for simplicity that alpha k is equal to alpha, so it's the inaccuracy of CSI estimate is the same for all the users for simplicity. What it means is that we have the error power scales as p to the minus uh, p to the power minus alpha. And so um, if alpha is a positive number, essentially the error decreases with the SNR and it decreases faster as alpha uh, increases. If we take alpha equal to zero, essentially these terms is a constant, or in other words, the CSIT error um, power will not change as a function of the SNR. If alpha is small but positive, the error will actually decrease with the SNR but very slowly. If alpha is very large, the error will decrease very quickly with the SNR. And so by changing alpha, we actually can observe a very wide range of regime where we have in one extreme is the, the, the CSIT is very poor. This corresponds to um, alpha equal to zero. If alpha is taken equal to infinity, it's the same as if we have perfect CSIT. Now, what we'll see in a minute is actually we don't have to go between alpha equal to zero and infinity. We can limit ourselves between zero and one. And the reason for this is because alpha equal to one is, from a degrees of freedom perspective, equivalent to having perfect CSIT. So let's look at how the degrees of freedom uh, degrades as a function of alpha when we use a conventional multi-user linear precoder. So we can use again zero forcing precoder, but now instead of doing designing the precoder based on the true channel, we have to design it based on the channel estimates h hat. And so what is happening at the receiver is that we are not able now uh, the precoder of of user one will will create interference to the other receivers. And each of those receivers will now experience multi-user interference. And this is what we see here. We have a residual interference term in each of those uh, receiver observations that is due to the fact that the zero forcing precoder was not able to fully eliminate the multi-user interference. And this interference term is proportional to H tilde, so this error um, the uh, estimation, uh, channel estimation error. Um, and so the question we have here is, how much loss do we have in uh, terms of DOF? And so we can compute this, and we say, for simplicity, let's assume that we have a uniform power allocation across all those streams. So we transmit with a power P uh, divided by K uniformly, and so the desired signals will uh, be received at the receiver K with a power proportional to P. The residual interference term that we have here, this, this part of the terms will scale as power P, 
this part here, the error, the estimation error, we remember from the model scales as p to the power minus alpha. So we have p to the power minus alpha multiplied by p, and this gives us a residual interference term whose power scales as p to the power one minus alpha. And then we have the noise power. And so the first thing we observe here is that if alpha is uh, larger than one, we have that this term here will actually be smaller than the noise power. So in other words, if alpha is larger than one, from a DOF perspective, it means that the residual interference is negligible compared to the noise. On the other hand, if alpha is smaller, uh, uh, smaller than one, the residual interference terms is not negligible compared to the noise. And we experience a DOF loss. And so what is our DOF now? Well, we can see the SINR at user K is equal by the ratio between the desired signals and the uh, sum of the interference plus noise. Assuming alpha is smaller than one, this term is dominant compared to the noise. And so we have that the SINR is the ratio between P and P to the power one minus alpha. And so that ratio gives us P to the power alpha. So now we have our rate, um, uh, our SINR scales as p to the power alpha, and so our rate will scale as log 2 p to the power alpha, or in other words, alpha log 2 p in the limit of high SNR. And so the pre-log factor of the rate now will be equal to alpha. It means that each user is able to achieve a DOF of alpha for alpha between zero and one. And so the sum DOF is equal to K alpha. In other words, the sum rate at high SNR will scale as K alpha log two P. And so K alpha now is the slope of the sum rate at high SNR. And this is what we see here on this figure. If alpha is equal to zero, this slope will be equal to zero. In other words, the sum rate will saturate at high SNR. If alpha is non-zero, essentially the slope increases all the way up to when alpha is equal to one. And so with alpha equal to one and alpha larger than one, the slope does not change anymore. The slope is equal to K and we recover the slope that we had in the perfect CSIT setting. So we see that by increasing alpha beyond one, the DOF does not change. The slope remains the same between alpha equal to one and alpha equal to 10. There is still a gain in terms of rate, but the slope and the DOF does not change. On the other hand, if alpha is smaller than one, the slope or the DOF change quite significantly. Um, and so depending on the channel estimation or the channel acquisition mechanism, essentially this alpha can vary very, very widely uh, between zero and, uh, and one. So as a reference, if we take a system like 4G and 5G, we have a fixed number of bits of feedback. And so this means that as the SNR increases, the quantization error that we have on the channel estimates uh, will not scale with the SNR. This is actually equivalent to saying that alpha is equal to zero. So this DOFK alpha is what we achieve with um, conventional uh, strategies. Um, and we'll see actually this is suboptimal. We can do better than that. OK, so um, to summarize what we said, we said if we have perfect CSIT, the interference can be fully eliminated and the full DOF is achieved, a DOF of K. If we have uh, imperfect CSIT or partial CSIT and alpha is larger than one, the inter user interference can be reduced to the noise level or within the noise level. We have seen that the residual interference is within the noise level. And so this means that we will not have any degrees of freedom loss. The slope will remain the slave, same as if we have perfect CSIT. If we have imperfect CSIT with alpha smaller than one, then the inter-user interference cannot be eliminated and is actually dominant compared to the noise uh, level. And so treating interference as noise, as we have done by computing the SINR and treating interference as noise, essentially leads to a degrees of freedom loss. And so the question that appears here is that if interference cannot be eliminated or reduced to the noise level, 
why don't we actually treat it as noise in this conventional multi-user uh, communication strategy? Instead, why not trying to decode it or partially decode it and remove it from the received signal? And this is where rate splitting comes in. So here again, the idea of rate splitting is to split the messages as we have seen in uh, the beginning of this tutorial, we split the message of each user into a common and private part. And so our um, common part will be decoded by all, and then the private part will be treated as noise by other users. But the question that occurs is, how do we split the messages? In what proportion do we split them? How much power do we allocate to those different messages and how we transmit them? Right. So, Again, the two messages that we have now are the private and the, the common parts. The private parts are always treated as noise and we'll try to uh, allocate their power such that they're always received at the noise level. The common parts, on the other hand, are always decoded by all the users. But so let's see how we actually, how rate splitting can boost the degrees of freedom. So I will look at the degrees of freedom of the private parts and the common parts, and we'll start with the private part. So I will um, do exactly the same as what we have done before with the conventional strategy, but instead of transmitting at full power, and we had uh, previously, we were divided the power of those K streams as P divided by K, now, instead of doing that, let's use a fraction of the transmit power. So I use P to the power alpha with alpha between zero and one, and I divide by K. So I use a fraction of the total transmit power. And so if I use a fraction of it, it means actually my uh, received signals, I have a desired signals in my receive observation uh, Y of K that scales as P to the power K. And the residual interference term is given by the power of the channel estimation error here is p to the power minus alpha and now i have a power here of this term that scales roughly as p to the power alpha so we have p to the power alpha multiplied by p to the power minus alpha and so this is equal to p to the power zero this is the same level as the noise power. So in other words, what we have done here, we have used power control and we have controlled the power of each of those K uh, streams, private uh, streams, such that the residual interference is at the same level as the noise. So what does that mean in terms of SINR? It means that now the SINR for this receiver K is equal to p to the power alpha divided by p to the power zero. In other words, I have uh, a SINR that scales as p to the power alpha for those each of those private streams. And so that means that now I have a DOF of each of those private streams that is equal to alpha and a sum DOF that is equal to k alpha. This is exactly the same sum DOF as what we had earlier on with conventional uh, multi-user precoding, but with the difference that now we have used only a fraction of the total power, we have used only p to the power alpha, and we have a remaining power that has not been used yet. So what is important here is that we have controlled the, the, the power of each of those streams such that the multi-user interference or the residual interference here is never larger than the noise level. And why we want to do this is because if we enter an interference limited regime, increasing the power allocated to those uh, interfering streams will not increase the SINR simply because the numerator will be increased, but the denominator will be increased as well. And so the SINR will not increase. And this is what we see here. We have a SINR that is P alpha. And previously here we had a SINR that was equal to p to the power alpha as well. In here, we were using the full power p divided by k. In this case here, we just use a fraction of the full power p to the power alpha divided by k. But the DOF has not changed because we have not entered the interference 
limited regime, and we achieve the same DOF but with a smaller power. So how can we use the remaining power? What is the remaining power? Is P, the total transmit power, minus P to the power alpha. This is the remaining power that we have, and we can use this to transmit something else. So what is this transmit something else? Is a new uh, message that is WC here that is encoded into a stream SC. And so we transmit additionally a new stream here that is precoded by a precoder PC. And the power that I allocate here to these common streams that is or this stream SC is given by P divided by P minus alpha. So the power allocated to that part here is P to the power alpha. The part allocated to here, to this common stream here, is P minus P to the power alpha. Okay, so if we look at the received observation now, we have um, my stream uh, SC, we have the private stream SK, and then we have the uh, residual multi-user interference between all those K uh, minus one uh, um, private streams. And so what we can do is first decode the common stream, first decode SC. And so when we decode SC, what is the SINR of SC? It's given by P divided by the sum of the interference plus noise. What we have is P to the power zero, P to the power zero, and P to the power alpha. So when we decode SC, this term is the dominant interference that SC sees, and so we have a sign that is given by P divided by P to the power alpha, and this gives us P to the power one minus alpha. So the SINR of the common stream is P to the power minus alpha. And so the rate will scale as log two P to the power one minus alpha. The pre-log factor of the rate one minus alpha goes in front of the log. And so we have a pre-log factor of the rate equal to one minus alpha, or in other words, the DOF of the common message WC that is equal to one minus alpha. Then we can perform SIC, assuming that the common stream has been decoded properly by all the users. We can cancel uh, SC at the receiver. And so once we have canceled, each receiver can decode its private stream SK by uh, seeing that the residual interference is within the noise level or the same level at the noise. And so by when we decode the private stream SK, we actually achieve uh, degrees of freedom of alpha. The SINR is equal to P to the power alpha, which leads to a decrease of freedom of alpha for the private stream K, and a sum degrees of freedom of all the private streams equal to K alpha. And so what is our sum DOF now? Is the DOF of the private stream, one minus alpha here, the DOF of the, the, the uh, sorry, the DOF of the common stream one minus alpha, it is here, and the sum of the DOF of the K private streams, K alpha, that is given by this. And so this is actually the uh, sum DOF that we achieve now by having this uh, superposition of K private streams and one um, common stream. And so what is left to be to do now is to load those uh, parts, the private and the common parts, with the user data. And so how we do that, we do this as follows. Instead of transmitting a new common message, SC, this common stream, is loaded with part of the user messages that we had originally. And what are those messages? Uh, W1 to WK. So we split those messages Again, W1 to WK are split into two parts, and now those are the private, the common parts. Those are the private parts, and those common parts will actually be, will be loaded onto this common stream SC, and the private parts will be loaded onto the private stream uh, S1 to SK. So this is a K user architecture of rate splitting using linear precoding. And those, after splitting those uh, messages, we, uh, we, we create, we go from essentially K, uh, K messages to K plus one streams, K 
private streams, one common streams, and then those k plus one streams are linearly recorded. Transmit it over uh, multiple antennas, NT transmit antennas, and then received at each of those receivers. And what we see at the receiver is that the, all the user first decode the common stream, so they decode uh, SC into WC, and then from WC they try each receiver try to retrieve the part that is intended to itself, performs SIC, and then retrieve the private part intended to itself. And then from those two parts, the common the private part, recombine them and and um, into the original uh, transmissive message WQ. Okay, so this is the same architecture as what we had earlier on, but now for a K user scenario when we have um, one SIC at the receiver. Now, what is important to keep in mind here is that in this architecture, we see that all those K messages have been split into a common part and to a private part. Modularly speaking, um, depending on our objective function on when we design the system, depending on whether we want to maximize sum rate or weighted sum rate or maximum fairness or other metric, we may adjust how many messages really needs to be split it. So it could be one message is split it. For instance, W1 is split it into a common and private part. And then all the other messages actually are not split it. And so they are transmitted directly into the private uh, streams here. And we don't need that part. This could happen in some scenario. This is sufficient, for instance, when we try to maximize uh, some rates. Um, or we could have uh, a subset of the messages are split it. So in general, splitting can be done for one users or for more users or for all users. It's important to remind that the common stream is actually decoded by all, but it's not necessarily intended to all users. If we split only the message of the first user and not the, the message of the other users, still all the users will have to decode the common streams. So the common streams in that case will be intended to user one only, but will have to be decoded by all the users. The private stream, uh, SK, will always be treated as noise by the other users. So whenever a user here try to decode his private streams, it will treat all the other private streams of all the other users or the multi-user interference coming from the other private streams will be treated as noise. And what is important, as we have seen, is to adjust the power location between SC, so the common stream, and the private streams in order to make sure that the multi-user or the residual interference here is within the noise level. And this reflects what we had here where we have we have done a power control and we have allocated the power smartly such that the residual interference is within the noise level among the private stream and this is reflected in these slides here as well where this multi-user interference coming from the private stream is within the noise level and so once we have adjusted that power level then the remaining power can be used to transmit the um, common stream OK, so this previous uh, architecture was based on linearly precoded uh, um, rate splitting. We can do something else based on nonlinear precoding or, uh, for instance, dirty pair precoding. And so in comparison with what we had here, where actually all those uh, K private streams here are encoded independently from each other and then linearly precoded, what we can do here is that we can encode them uh, differently using nonlinear precoding or using dirty paper coding. And this is an example that we have here. We have uh, the K private streams are now encoded using dirty paper coding, and then they are super superimposed on top of these um, common streams before being transmitted over the year. Right, so this is a different encoding strategy for the private streams, and this will be denoted as uh, dirty paper coded uh, rate splitting uh, later on. OK, so to summarize what we have seen in terms of degrees of freedom is the following. 
assuming we have this imperfect CSIT model that is very general, we have an estimate and an error, and this error scales as p to the power minus alpha, with alpha is this CSIT inaccuracy, a measure of the CSIT inaccuracy. Um, and it ranges between zero and infinity, and from, a d from zero means actually we have a pretty bad estimate of the CSI. It corresponds to having a CSIT error that does not scale with the SNR. And so, for instance, it can be represented or uh, in practice, it can be, uh, it can occur whenever we have a fixed number of feedback bits when we do CSI quantization. Um, and as alpha increases, essentially here, the quality of the CSI increases. Uh, alpha equal to one, we have seen this is equivalent from a DOF perspective, um, um, as is equivalent to perfect CSIT from a DOF uh, perspective. And so if we do conventional communication strategy like multi-user linear precoding or even dirty paper coding that do not rely on any form of rate splitting, well, the degrees of freedom, the sum degrees of freedom that we achieve is K multiplied by alpha. If we have perfect CSIT, alpha is equal to one from a DOF perspective, and so the DOF is equal to K. Unfortunately, this is suboptimal. K alpha is suboptimal for imperfect CSIT. When we move to rate splitting, what we see is that on top of K alpha, we have one minus alpha. And so whether we do linearly precoded rate splitting or some more complicated form of nonlinear precoded rate splitting, we're going to achieve the same sum DOF. And interestingly, if alpha is equal to one, this term here disappears and we have this term is equal to K. And so we end up having the same DOF, the same sum DOF as what we had here with perfect CSIT. If alpha is not equal to one, is smaller than one, this is actually the optimal sum DOF that we can achieve. So we cannot not achieve anything better than that. Right, so to reflect on one more thing to, um, to state here that is interesting to keep an eye on, if alpha is equal to one here, we're saying just a second ago, that this term will disappear. So what that means is actually that the power that I allocate to the common streams, if alpha is equal to one, this power is equal to zero. So in other words, from a DOF perspective, if alpha is equal to one, if we have good CSIT quality, essentially from a DOF perspective, we turn off the common streams. So if the CSIT quality is good enough, at some point from a DOF perspective, we turn off these common streams. If the DOF, if the CSIT quality is not good enough, then we need to allocate power to this common stream. And the power located to the common stream increases as the CSIT quality degrades. Okay, so this is the uh, optimal sum DOF. This is not only optimal from uh, some degrees of freedom perspective, but we can show that actually this is optimal from an entire degrees of freedom region perspective. Uh, rate splitting achieved the entire, um, the optimal uh, degrees of freedom region. So let's look at this uh, degrees of freedom region in the two user scenario. We have degrees of freedom of user one, degrees of freedom of user two. We have three different strategies. The dashed line here is when we do OMA or TDA. So orthogonal multiple access, whether it's TDMA or FDMA. Um, and actually, NORMA would actually also achieve this uh, degrees of freedom here. If we have the green line here is what we have with multi-user linear precoding, where we treat residual interference as noise at the receiver. This is what we have when we do classical multi-user MIMO or um, 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 zero forcing beamforming, for instance, or SDMA. And so what we have is actually we have this point here that corresponds to having each streams in this two user case achieving uh, per user DOF of alpha. So user one achieve a DOF of alpha, user two achieve a DOF of alpha, and the sum DOF here is equal to two alpha because we have two users. Now in blue here, this is the DOF region that is achieved by rate splitting. 
and we see is strictly larger than what we have with conventional strategies. And this is actually the optimal degrees of freedom region. You cannot get the degrees of freedom region larger than this. And we have two corner points here. And those two corner points correspond to uh, how we make use of the common uh, message. So if we allocate uh, the common message to user one, um, it means that the, you, the common message will carry, carry information only intended to user one. And in that case, user one will achieve a DOF of one, user two will achieve a DOF of alpha. So how can we see this? Well, if the common message is carries information intended to user one only, and so in other words, we split only the message of user one into common and private part, we don't split the message of user two, then the DOF of user one will be equal to the DOF of the common message plus the DOF of the private message. This is one minus alpha plus alpha, this is equal to one. And the DOF of user two will be equal to alpha. This other corner point here is achieved when we actually uh, change how we may use the common message. And now we split the message of user two into two parts, a common and, and private part. And the common streams carries information for user two. So in that case, we have um, the private uh, streams of user one achieve a DOF of alpha and user one, uh, user two, achieve a DOF of one that is equal to one minus alpha plus alpha because the, uh, the, the in this case, the common streams carries uh, information intended to user two only. And any point here in between can be either obtained by doing time sharing between those two strategies or by splitting the messages among user one and user two such that we can achieve any points in between. So here we actually split the message of user one only. Here we split the message of user two uh, only. And here in between, we could split the message of user one and user two. And according to this split, we can move along this uh, line. Alternatively, we can simply do a time sharing between those two strategies. So this uh, sum DOF, that we showed here has a very nice interpretation. It's a sum of two parts, one minus alpha and k alpha. And this can be interpreted as follow. We can view this um, MISO broadcast channel as a superposition of two subnetworks. One subnetwork that has perfect CSIT, but operating on a fraction of the total power, and the other subnetworks having no CSIT and operating on the remaining fraction of the total power. So the first subnetwork is this one, that is a perfect CSIT MISO broadcast channels, but for which we only use a fraction of the total power. So these subnetworks can achieve a sum DOF of K alpha. And then on top of this, superposing the power domain, we have another subnetworks that correspond to a MISO broadcast channels, but with no CSIT and for which we allocate the remaining power one minus alpha. Now we can show that these subnetworks achieve a DFK alpha, and these subnetworks here that does not have any CSIT actually achieve a DOF of one multiplied by the power that has been allocated to it, so it's one minus alpha. And so the sum of those two is equal to the one minus alpha plus K alpha. And what we do when we do rate splitting, we essentially load data onto those two subnetworks depending on the CSIT quality alpha. And this is achieved by these rate splitting strategies through the message splits. Now, what does that mean to have a DOF enhancement? It means that essentially the sum rate will increase um, faster with the SNR. And this is reflected here in this um, this figure, we have some rate here, we have SNR. The blue curves is when we do multi-user linear precoding, conventional multi-user linear precoding using zero forcing precoder. The red one is when we do rate splitting using precoder for the, com uh, for the private stream that are based on zero forcing precoder as well. And what we notice is the increase in the slope. So we have alpha equal to 0 0.5. We have two users here. 
So we have a sum DOF here that is K alpha. So two user multiplied by 0 0.5 is two times 0 0.5 is equal to one. The slope here is equal to one. The slope here is equal to one minus alpha plus K alpha. So one minus alpha is 0 0.5 and K alpha is equal to one in this setup. So we have here a slope of 1.5 versus a slope of one here, we have 50% enhancement in terms of DOF, in terms of slope, and this is reflected, uh, this translate into a uh, sum rate gain, where we see that actually the sum rate increase much faster with rate splitting in red than with conventional strategies, right? So the DOF increase is reflected, not uh, translated into a slope increase, and this slope increase translate into uh, a rate increase. Similarly, if we have K user, uh, four users here, we have again a DOF increase um, and therefore a slope increase and a rate increase. Now we can look at other metrics. This is um, a rate region, ergodic rate region, where we had the possibility to fully optimize the precoder using stochastic optimization. And this is something we'll treat in a later section. But what I want to illustrate is how the DOF gain translate into uh, um, ergodic rate region uh, enhancement or enlargement. So we have seen here that the DOF gain leads to a rate enhancement, some rate enhancement. In general, it leads to an uh, entire uh, rate regions uh, enlargement. And so this is again in red is no rate splitting, conventional multi-user linear, linear precoding, but fully optimized. So we optimize the power location across all the streams along with the, the precoders, um, taking into account the imperfect CSIT. And what we and in blue we have the rate splitting that has been optimized as well. And so what we see is that as the SNI increases, it's really the gap between the rate region achieved by no RS and the one with RS increases, and that reflects essentially this DOF gain. So what we observe is that rate splitting uh, increase the DOF, increase the sum rate, but also enlarges the rate region. This is another example of a rate enhancement where we compare multiple schemes, not only multi-user linear precoding and rate splitting, but we have five schemes on this figure. We have again a rate region, ergodic rate region of user one, user two. We have five schemes. The yellow schemes is non-orthogonal multiple access. So this is called SCSIC. It's the same as non-orthogonal multiple access applied to a multi-antenna setup, a MISO broadcast channel. So user one, for instance, will fully decode the message of user two or inversely, and we fully optimize the precoder. And so we see that the performance is quite, quite poor here compared to other strategies. Uh, in green, we have multi-user linear precoding. So this is um, similar or this is the same as uh, space division multiple access or conventional multi-user MIMO, um, where we again optimize the precoders. And in blue, we have dirty paper coding. So dirty paper coding is the capacity achieving strategy when we have perfect CSIT. This is not dirty paper coding applied to an imperfect CSIT setup. And so we see that DPC indeed outperforms multi-user linear precoding, which outperforms norm. What we have here are the RS space schemes. In red is linearly precoded rate splitting. In uh, violet, uh, we have dirty paper coded rate splitting. And so what we see here is that the rate splitting schemes outperform all the other schemes. And the rate splitting that is based on linear precoding in red even outperform DPC, which has a much higher complexity. Right, so in conclusion, what we observe here is that rate splitting schemes outperforms all conventional uh, schemes that do not rely on rate splitting, and that could be SDMA or multi-user linear precoding or multi-user MIMO, all the, the normal schemes and dirty paper coding. And the reason for this is because it's really driven by fundamentals uh, of uh, when we have imperfect CSIT, it's inherently robust to imperfect CSIT, um, and it's optimal in terms of degrees of freedom in contrast to all those uh, other schemes here. Right, so this is another example of rate enhancement 
uh, with another metric. Instead of having some rate or ergodic rate region, we have here a robust maximum fairness problem. So we want to maximize the minimum rate among all the users. So if you have three users, as is in this problem here and in perfect CSIT, we want to maximize the minimum rate among those three users. And we have no rate splitting techniques here without rate splitting, multi-user linear precoding, fully optimized to try to maximize the maximum rate under imperfect CSIT. And we have rate splitting here that has been optimized as well. And what we notice is that the no rate splitting actually saturates at high SNR. It saturates because it's so much limited by the multi-user interference that is uh, originic from the imperfect CSIT that it cannot uh, that the SIN, SINR at some point will be interference limited and the rate will saturate. On the other hand, the rate splitting does not saturate. Uh, the rate keeps increasing uh, whatever the SNR. And so we see the significant gain observed uh, provided by rate splitting over no rate splitting here across a very wide range of SNR from low SNR all the way to high SNR. Let's now look at the next section, which is about the second motivation for using uh, rate splitting. And this motivation is about uh, multiple access and viewing rate splitting as an enabler of a unified multiple access strategy that is called rate splitting multiple access. So a common multiple access strategy is SDMA. We have seen it already in the in this tutorial um, SDMA so space division multiple access multiplex users in spatial domain using multi user linear precoding and this is the uh, commonly used in practice in 4G and 5G um, in multi-user MIMO in comp coordinated multi-point in network MIMO millimeter of MIMO massive MIMO now the benefits of SDMA is first to be able to reap all spatial multiplexing or DOF benefits of multi-antenna broadcasters with perfect CSIT. And we have seen this previously. We have seen that when we have perfect CSIT, if the number of transmit antenna is larger than the number of users, multi-user linear precoding achieves a sum DOF of K, which is the optimal sum DOF. And the interesting part is to be able to reap this DOF benefit, but with a low precoder complexity and a low receiver complexity. Only simple linear precoding, for instance, based on zero forcing informing, and that the receiver simply treated, treating in, uh, residual interference as noise or any form of interference as noise. The drawback is to, um, to be suited for to the underloaded regime and not uh, and not for the overloaded regime. So it works well for underloaded regime, which is a very important scenario, which uh, assumes that the number of transmit antennas is larger than the number of users. If we have an overloaded regime where the number of users is larger than the number of transmit antennas, and we have to deliver uh, K messages to those uh, K users, but we're having a number of transmit antenna that is smaller than K, then we have um, a lot of interference remaining in the network and uh, SDMA is, uh, has difficulty to cope with this um, multi-user interference. The second drawback is that it works well with, when the channels of the users are semi-orthogonal or orthogonal and they have similar channel strength. It doesn't work uh, as well when those conditions are not met. So in more general settings, when we don't have semi-aligned users or uh, where we have um, disparity of channel strength. And the last drawback, we have seen it already, is the fact that the DOF is optimal, SDMA achieves the optimal DOF when we have perfect CSIT, but not when we have imperfect CSIT. The DOF achieved by SDMA is equal to K alpha, if in imperfect CSIT, and as we have seen in the first motivation, this is suboptimal. But the important bits of SDMA is um, from an interference management perspective, what we do is to fully treat any residual interference as those. Now, another multiple access strategy is non-orthogonal multiple access. 
and aims at multiplexing users in the power domain um, primarily and and if it's combined with MIMO in the power and the spatial domain using uh, linearly precoded superposition coding with a successive interference cancellation. Right. So this notion of superposition coding with SIC is known for a very long time since the uh, 70s. Um, and in recent years, this has been uh, leveraged and, and applied to multi antenna settings. Now, the pros or the advantage of NOMA is that it can cope with an overloaded regime with diversity of user channel strength. Um, and this is um, evident from the, the, the setup for which it has been designed, which is the size of broadcast channels, where we have naturally one transmitter antennas and multiple users, the system is naturally overloaded, and the gain over or, uh, orthogonal multiple access is well known to occur whenever there is a diversity of channel strength. Now, the drawback of NOMA is that the strategy was motivated by the single antenna broadcast channels. It's not been motivated by multi antenna broadcast channels. And, um, and as a consequence, it works well when the channels, are, the channels users, the, the user channels are aligned uh, with each other and experience a, a diver, uh, disparity of channel strength. If the channels are not aligned, then uh, the performance drops uh, significantly. A third drawback is that it incurs uh, larger complexity, uh, but both the transmitter and the receivers compared to STME. Uh, larger complexity because aside the design of the precoders, we have to uh, decide uh, how to pair users together and, and in what, what is the decoding orders of those different users. So which user decodes the message of which other users. And it incurs a higher complexity at the receiver because multiple layers of successive interference cancellation needs to be implemented. Now, importantly, the uh, NOMA in multi antenna settings incurs a DOF loss. It incurs a DOF loss in both perfect CSIT and imperfect CSIT. So, in contrast to SDMA that has the optimal, achieved the optimal uh, DOF with low complexity when we have perfect CSIT, NOMA does not even achieve the optimal DOF and uh, incurs uh, complexity uh, increase. In the imperfect CSIT, both SDMA and NOMA incurs a DOF loss. Now, what's the main property of NOMA from an interference management is to be, uh, is to ask or request some users to fully decode the message of other users. So in other words, is to ask some users to fully decode and cancel interference created by other users. Now, rate splitting is uh, the enabler of uh, more powerful and more general uh, multiple access schemes called rate splitting multiple access. And Rate splitting multiple access multiplex user in the spatial and power domain using linearly precoded rate splitting with successive interference cancellation. Now the properties is not to treat to fully treat interference as noise, not to fully decode interference as we have in SDMA and NOMA, but is to partially decode uh, interference and partially treat the remaining interference as noise. And this is done by this message split and by adjusting the message split. And as a consequence of this, it enables a very, um, um, very uh, broad class of communication strategies and multiple access strategies, and that can bridge the extremes of NOMA and SDMA. Now, the advantage of um, RSMA is to encompass SDMA and NOMA as special cases. So SDMA and NOMA are just particular instances of a more general class of multiple access strategy that is based on RSMA. The rate of RSMA um, and other metrics like energy efficiency 
of RSMA will always be larger or equal to SDMA and NOMA. The um, it, RSMA is optimal from a degrees of freedom perspective in both perfect and imperfect CSIT, and it copes with any user deployment, uh, whether the channels of the users are aligned or semi-orthogonal or orthogonal, uh, whether they, are, they have experienced this party of channel strength or not, um, whatever the CSIT inaccuracies and uh, any network loads. So depending on on the deployment, CSIT inaccuracy and network load, the RSMA always adjust to find the best uh, configuration and can cope as a, um, as a consequence to any of those uh, possibilities. And because the framework is, is more general, it enables to find uh, um, strategies that actually have actually relatively low complexity. And in particular, it provides a lower computational complexity than NOMA um, and at the same time provides higher performance. And this is something we'll see also in, in this section. Now, the drawback is that the encoding is a bit more complicated, and we have seen it already. Instead of encoding K message into K streams, now we have to encode K message into K plus one streams. So we have one more streams to be encoded potentially in the uh, rate splitting uh, schemes that we have seen so so far. This, this leads to a slightly higher encoding complexity at the transmitter. Now this is a general picture of RSMA, and what we see here we have um, SDMA and multicasting at two particular sub scheme of a first type class of strategy, which is one layer rate splitting. And one layer rate splitting is the, the rate splitting strategy that we have seen so far, where we split the message of user one to K into common and private part, and we create one additional common stream on top of the K private streams. And so each receiver requires one SIC. A two layer rate splitting is a slightly more general uh, rate splitting uh, strategies that relies on multiple layer, uh, multiple split of the messages and potentially two um, SIC at each receiver. Um, NOMA is uh, another class of multiple access schemes and RSMA is actually a general framework uh, that encompass all those different strategies. So what we will see uh, now is this one layer rate splitting, this low complexity, which is what we have seen earlier. We'll see the two layer rate splitting. We'll see the general rate splitting multiple access and how this actually encompass all those uh, existing schemes. So in the two user case, we have seen it already in the first part of this tutorial that rate splitting is more general than SDMA multicasting and NOMA. So NOMA multicasting and SDMA in the two user uh, case are just subsets of uh, rate splitting. And this is um, again um, what we have seen earlier on and now it should be clear to, to all of you. We have a two user rate splitting strategy, linearly precoded strategy. Um, and we have here a mapping of um, messages to streams. And so again, what we see is that the rate splitting split the message into common and private parts for both messages here, put some of those uh, parts into the private streams and the remaining part in the common streams. The private parts, we treat interference as noise among those private parts and we fully decode, both user decodes the common streams, right? Now, we have seen this by splitting the message and by adjusting how we split the message, essentially rate splitting can boil down to any of those four sub-schemes. If I do not allocate anything to the private streams here and I put everything into the common stream, I end up doing multicasting. I can end up doing uh, autonomous multiple access. I can end up doing NOMA when actually I force to put the message of user one into private stream number one and the private the, the message of user two into the common streams. And 
can end up doing uh, SDMA when I force the message of user one to be encoded in private stream number one and the message of user two to be encoded in private streams number two. Now let's look at the three user example and of a general form of rate splitting. Um, and this is, uh, this is the architecture of this generalized rate splitting for three users. Now what we see here is that we have three messages and instead of splitting those three messages into one common message or one common part and one private part, we split this uh, message W1 into multiple parts. So we have W1 that is split into this part here, this part there, this part there, and this part there. So it's split into four parts. And um, the subscript here means that um, wh which user will decode the message. So this will be actually the private part of user one, and this will be a common part of user one, and a common part of user one, and another common part of user one. But this part will be decoded by user one and three, this one will be decoded by user one and two, and this one will be decoded by user one, two, three. And the same for the other two messages, we can split them into four parts as well. And so the parts that have to be decoded by the three users have the subscript one, two, three, they encode it into a common message and a common stream that this has to be decoded by the three users. This part here is uh, to be decoded by user one and two only. And so this is encoded into a stream S12 that will be decoded by user one and two. This part here is encoded into a stream S13 that has to be decoded by user one and three. And this part has to be decoded by user two and three. And so at the receiver, what we have, we have multiple layers of SIC. And we have user one has to decode first S123, or all users decode S123 first, that is intended to the largest number of users. And then from there, retrieve that part of the message and user one will try to retrieve this part of the, the common message uh, um, that is intended to himself. So, and then performs SIC, then decode here S12, S13, retrieve this part and this part here into W112, W113, and then performs in SIC. And finally, we'll try to retrieve its private part, W1. And so from those four parts, it reconstructs the original message. Now, this framework is uh, extendable to any number of users, to a K users, and SDMA and NOMA, again, a subset of that rate splitting uh, multiple access framework. Whereas SDMA is when we turn off all those common streams here, we only keep those three. Whereas NOMA is when we take this one, S123, S12, and S1, and we map W1 into S1, we map W2 into S2, S12, and we map W3 into S123, right? So this is a relatively complex architecture, right? But the whole purpose here is to be able to um, design it and optimize it to identify what messages really and what streams really lead to a performance gain. And so, Substrategies can be designed based on this if they actually can uh, come very close to the optimal performance that we can achieve with that framework. For instance, I can turn off those three common streams here and end up having only one layer of rate splittings, only one stream that has to be decoded by those three users. Right? That could be one, al well, one alternative we'll see in a minute. Right? So this is this one layer rate splitting, low complexity strategies, if I have K users, I want to have only one common streams. And this is the common stream that is intended to those K users. And so in these three user examples here, that one layer rate splitting is obtained by keeping this common stream here, those three private streams and turning off those three common streams here, right? So that would be not as good as this generalized rate splitting, but would have lower complexity and potentially can come very close to the performance of this generalized rate splitting. Now this one layer rate splitting, if we have, um, uh, this is a modular uh, scheme than 
um, than SDMA or MULP because by turning off this common stream, I end up having the classical MULP or SDMA uh, framework is actually not a superset of NOMA schemes, right? If we have K, the number of users is larger than two, strictly larger than two, this is not a superset of NOMA schemes. If K is equal to two, we have seen this here, that indeed rate splitting is a subset, uh, is a superset of SDMA and NOMA, um, and incurs only one SIC and one common streams, but if we go for more than two users and we have only one layer of rate splitting, one common streams, then NOMA is not a subset of that strategy, right? So it's a different strategy that would still use SIC, but differently um, and potentially can have lower complexity because it only has one uh, SIC because of one common stream. So this is uh, uh, represented here. We have a base station, multiple antennas, we have K private streams, S1 to SK, and then we have this common stream here, S uh, subindex K here, which is this private stream, uh, this common stream that has to be decoded by all the users, but carry information potentially intended to a subset of those users. Another strategy is a two-layer rate splitting, which is slightly more general than the one-layer rate splitting, um, and that consists in um, having two types of common uh, message. I have a common message here or common stream that has to be decoded by all the users, user one to user K. And here I have um, common messages that have to be decoded by a subset of those users. So by the users within a, a group KG. And then we have the private streams. So here's an example. I have here four users. I have four private uh, streams, S1, S2, S3 and S4, and then I have three common uh, streams. I have streams S12, that this has to be decoded by user 1 and 2, a stream S34, that is decoded by user 3 and 4, and a stream S1234, that is decoded by all those four users, right? And so we see that actually this is more general than the one layer rate splitting, because if I turn off this part here, I end up having one common streams and the private streams, and this is what we had in the one layer rate splitting. So this uh, hierarchical rate splitting or two layer rate splitting uh, potentially can achieve higher performance than the one layer rate splitting, but it incurs higher complexity because we have more common streams and this needs uh, two SICs at each receivers. So user one will have to decode S1234 first, then decode S12, and then decode this private stream S1, and from those three uh, streams, we'll be able to reconstruct the original message. Now, MULP SDMA, again, is a subset of these schemes. If I turn off this, if I turn off that, I end up with um, um, SDMA, MULP. NOMA, depending on how you redesign it, is not necessarily a subset of this strategy, but could be a subset of, of, of this, this uh, strategy. Okay, so let's look at some numerical results where we compare SDMA, NOMA, and uh, RSMA. And we look at um, uh, a, a two-user scenario first, where we have uh, two channels, H1 that is given by this and H2 that is given by that. And what we see here, we have only two parameters. And this scenario is very insightful because by changing uh, delta, um, theta, we actually, by increasing theta, we actually increase the angle between those two channels. So as I increase theta, essentially the two channels becomes more and more orthogonal to each other. And gamma here is representative of the disparity of channel strength. So if gamma is smaller than one, the norm of uh, the channel of user two will be smaller than the norm of the channel of user one. Right? So let's look at this effect of uh, channel alignment and orthogonality that is captured through uh, theta. And let's look at the effect of the channel strength disparity captured through gamma. The other thing we can see is the effect of the load when we have an underloaded regime or overloaded. So this is the red region, perfect CSIT. All the schemes are optimized here. Uh, we have four transmit antennas. We have gamma is equal to one. So the channels of the two users have 
equals strength, and we have 20 dB SNR. It's because it's perfect CSIT, we know what's the capacity region, we know that the best uh, rate region, uh, so the capacity region, is achieved by dirty paper coding, and this is what we have in blue. So in those four figures here, blue represents dirty paper coding, this is the capacity region, we cannot get something that beats that, right? We have the red one is rate splitting, linear precoded rate splitting, uh, green one is multi-user linear precoding, and yellow one is normal. And we have four figures, and as we increase, we go from A to B to C to D, essentially what changed is theta, we change the angle, so we go from a small angle to a larger angle, so as we go from A to D, essentially, the angle between the two channels increases and the two channels becomes more and more orthogonal to each other. So when the two channels are more uh, aligned or semi-aligned with each other, what we see is that here, NOMA does not work well in this setup. MULP is uh, slightly better, rate splitting is much better and comes much closer to uh, dirty paper coding. Uh, even though it has lower complexity, right? So here what we see is that indeed rate splitting um, is outperformed by DPC, uh, which is uh, normal in the perfect CSIT. We have seen earlier on in the uh, motivation one that actually rate splitting outperform DPC when we have imperfect CSIT. Right? So this is when we have a small angle. As we increase the angle, what we see is that multi-user linear precoding performance increases, rate splitting increases as well. And then as we have a large angle between the two users, we see that multi-user linear precoding performs as well as rate splitting and DPC. In other words, multi-user linear precoding is, is sufficient in that setup. There is no need to go for more complex solution. On the other hand, NORMA still does not perform well. If we look at a scenario where we have uh, a disparity of channel strength, so rather than having gamma equal to 1, I have gamma equal to 0 0.3, and so that means actually I have a 10 dB gap, 10 dB disparity of channel strength between the channels of user 1 and the channel of user 2. And what we see now is that we have a change. We have here, um, we have the same four schemes again, and we have the green one is multi-user linear precoding. That does not work well when we have semi-aligned uh, uh, users and uh, disparity of channel strengths. On the other hand, the yellow one, NOMA, works better. Rate splitting outperforms NOMA slightly, and then we have the performance of DPC in blue. And as we increase the angle between the two channels, we see that we have a crossover between MULP and NOMA. In some regime, NOMA works better than MULP. In other regime, MULP performs better than NOMA. But rate splitting always outperform them all because MULP and NORMA are just subset of rate splitting in these two user setup. And rate splitting comes closer to uh, DPC uh, region. As long as we increase the angle between the two channels, we see that actually again MULP, rate splitting, and DPC overlap with each other, and NORMA does not uh, perform well. Okay, so let's look at. Uh, this uh, compare. Let's compare rate splitting NOMA and and OMA uh, slightly differently. Here I have three figures where I'm looking at the weighted sum rate. Um, so the sum of the weighted rate of those two users. So U1 R1 plus U2 R2, and I'm assuming perfect CSIT. And I have three different sub figures here with different weights. And what we're looking at is how and when uh, rate splitting boils down to SDMA uh, and OMA. So how, when rate splitting uh, uh, or rate splitting multiple access boils down to SDMA and OMA and potentially NOMA as well. As a function of what? As a function of two parameters, rho, which is the, uh, a measure of the angle between the two channels. So as rho increase from 0 to 1, essentially the two channels becomes more and more orthogonal to each other. So rho is equal to 0, correspond to two channels that are aligned with each other. Rho equal to 1, correspond to two channels that are uh, orthogonal to each other. And we have a disparity of channel strength here that, that goes between 0 and minus 20 dB. And so in, uh, let's, look at this uh, figure, for instance, here, where we have the weights are the same for the two users, and what we observe is that if we have 
the users are relatively aligned with each other or semi-aligned with each other, and we have some disparity of channel strength, well, rate splitting essentially boils down to OMA. In that case, we better do OMA. If we actually increase the angle between the two channels and we have um, the two channels becomes close to semi-orthogonal, if the disparity of channel strength is not too large, then rate splitting boils down to SDMA. And the whole region here, where we're not really in fully orthogonal channels and we have a disparity of channel strength, essentially rate splitting does not boil down to OMA or SDMA. And we notice that in this figure, we don't have NOMA. So NOMA is not even uh, a suitable strategy in, in this setup. In this scenario here, slightly different, we put uh, more weights for user one than for user two. And so we see that rate splitting boils down to OMA for a larger set of propagation conditions. The region where SDMA is the best is actually reduced. And we have in yellow the region where we have to do rate splitting. And so we really have to split the messages. And the last part here is when we put more emphasis on user two. So the user two is the, the weaker user. So we have put a higher weight on user two. And this is a region where we see that rate splitting boils down to NOMA. So in this region here, rate splitting now boils down to NOMA. Um, no OMA is performed here. SDMA is performed when the, the two channels are very uh, uh, orthogonal to each other, and rate splitting multiple access is performed uh, here, where we really have to split uh, the message into common and private parts. So this shows you how the rate splitting multiple access boils down to existing sub-strategies of OMA, SDMA, and NOMA, and when it doesn't boils down to any of those three strategies. And this is what we see with the yellow part. For some of those regimes, rate splitting does not boil down to any of those existing schemes. And so would strictly outperform them in those, regi in those uh, regions. All right, so let's look at another scenario. We looked at the two user case so far. Let's look at um, another scenario with 10 users. We have now an overloaded regime. We have two transmit antennas, but we have 10 users, and we want to deliver 10 messages to those 10 users, still using perfect CSIT. And so what we see here is we have a weighted sum rate, we have SNR, and we have different strategies. Now, the interesting one are those three here, MULP. So I have two transmit antennas, and I want to deliver 10 messages to 10 users, only using two transmit antennas. And we see that the performance does not work really well, even though the precoders are fully optimized. And the reason for this is because it's very difficult to deliver 10 messages to 10 users with only two transmit antennas, right? And guaranteeing some quality of service to those users. NORMA is in yellow, outperforms uh, MULP or SDMA slightly. Um, and then we have in pink, we have rate splitting. Now, what is important to note here is this is one layer rate splitting. So we see the significant gap between one layer rate splitting, NORMA and MULP. But importantly, one layer rate splitting only use one SIC at each user, while NORMA here use nine SICs at each user, right? So there is a huge complexity difference between NORMA in yellow and rate splitting in pink. Rate splitting is much less complex than NOMA and leads to significant performance enhancement. And the reason for this is because rate splitting is a very general framework. Um, and so it enables us to identify communication strategies that actually really uh, suit it for the specific deployment that we're looking at. We do not force ourselves to fully decode interference because there are many scenarios for which it's not good to fully decode interference. We try to partially decode interference, partially treat it as noise. And as a consequence of this, we can actually lead, obtain schemes that have much lower complexity than NOMA, but have a much better performance at the same time. Right, so we have uh, many other simulation results that you can see in the, simula in, the, uh, in the reference later on with imperfect CSIT. I have given some in motivation one already. Um, essentially, what we observed is that the one layer rate splitting is a low 
uh, complexity strategies that has a relatively low receiver complexity because it uses only one SIC at the receiver and that has a pretty good performance in uh, all user deployment, CSIT and accuracy and network load. We have compared one layer rate splitting with two layer rate splitting uh, and the generalized rate splitting in the reference papers and we can see that the gap is relatively small. In some cases, the gap is a bit larger, but in general, uh, if we have, if we look at a trade-off between complexity and performance, we can see that one-layer resplitting works quite efficiently. Let's now move on to um, section five about pre-coder optimization. So for the rate splitting architecture or rate splitting multiple access architectures that we have seen earlier on, the pre-coders and the power location could potentially be optimized. Um, and so in many of the simulation results I have shown already in the previous sections, um, for some of them, the uh, precoder optimization was already applied. So this section is about looking at um, how we optimize uh, the precoders uh, very briefly for weighted sum rate, uh, for ergodic sum rate, and for robust maximums. So we will consider perfect CSIT and imperfect CSIT. So um, the scenario we'll uh, look at is the one layer rate splitting, but the same framework can be extended to the, the multiple layer rate splitting or generalized uh, rate splitting. So as a reminder, we have our uh, transmit uh, signal vector that is given by uh, pre-coded common streams here and k uh, private streams, pre-coded private streams. So let's denote by p the uh, the matrix containing all those columns, those k plus one columns, so the k plus one pre-coders for the common and private streams, and by p, p the pre-coders for the private streams. And so we have a power constraint that says that the total power, so the, the sum of the norm, square of the norm of um, the precoders has to be smaller or equal to uh, p. And so um, we can, uh, in some of the examples earlier on, when we looked at zero forcing, for instance, we looked at um, um, simple design of the precoders, for instance, based on zero forcing, we could in general use optimize those precoders. And so in some of the optimization I mentioned earlier, those uh, precoder optimization were done. But the precoder optimization or the choice of precoder will ultimately influence the rate of the users, the rate of the common, and the rate of the private. So, what are the challenges here? Is actually to optimize those precoders um, uh, commonly leads to non-convex problems. Um, and the second uh, challenge really occurs when we have imperfect CSIT, because in that scenario, the transmitter does not know H, but only know H hat. And so this leads to a number of issues in terms of achievability of the instantaneous rate. The instantaneous rate of the common and the private streams are um, not known by the transmitters because the transmitter does not know H, but only knows H hat. Um, and this leads to rates that are not necessarily achievable. And so we have to make sure that actually the metric we come up with are uh, meaningful in the sense that the transmission uh, can be carried out at a reliable uh, rate. And so often, for instance, we can look at ergodic rates to make sure that the rate is achievable uh, despite the presence of uh, imperfect CSIT. Okay, so let's look at first the perfect CSIT setting uh, and look at uh, weighted sum rate maximization. So we have one layer rate splitting. Um, so according to this here, and when we formulate the optimization problem, what do we have here? We have a weighted sum rate, and the weighted sum rate is characterized by this term here, is a sum over the k users of the weight of a given user k multiplied by the rate of that user k. Now here we really see that we perform rate splitting because the rate of user k has been split into two parts and is the sum of two parts. Part of it comes from a portion of the the rate of the common stream, and part of it comes from the rate of the private streams. And so uh, we want to maximize over 
or the precoders, the common precoders and the private precoders, but we also want to maximize over C. So what is C? Is a vector that contains all those uh, portions CK. So uh, what that means is that we want to optimize how the rate of the common stream is split among the different users. And this is important when we do weighted sum rate maximization. Now, what is this constraint here? It says that the sum of the CK, the sum of the CK is actually the rate of the common stream, the, the rate at which we transmit the common streams. And what this says is that because all the users have to decode this common stream, the rate at which we transmit the common stream has to be smaller than the rate at which each of the users can decode the common streams. So the rate at which we transmit the common stream has to be smaller than the rate at which each of the users can decode the common streams. And so um, if it has to be decoded by all those users, it has to be smaller than the minimum of the rate at which each user can decode it. This constraint is the average power constraint, and this says that the portion of the rate that of the common rate that is allocated to user K is non-negative. So what are those quantities, RCK and RK are given here? This is the rate at which the user K can decode the common streams. And so it has a numerator that is given by the precode of the common stream multiplied by its vector channels. And what he sees here is the interference coming from the private streams. And so when it decodes, a user K decodes its common stream, it treats the private streams as noise. And this is what we see here. The rate of the private streams is obtained as follows. Here we have the numerator that is the power of the intended uh, signal uh, strength. Um, and we have here the interference that is coming from the uh, other private stream. So the one that are different from K. And so we see that we don't have a precoder PC here. We don't have any contribution of the common stream here because we assume that when we decode the private streams, the common stream has been fully decoded and uh, correctly decoded by uh, the SIC. So this is a general framework. And where is the classical no rate splitting here? Well, it's simply obtained by putting a zero rate to those common parts. So if we do not allocate any power to the common part, essentially we can uh, remove this, we can remove this constraint and we can remove this constraint and we end up with the classical weighted sum rate maximization of no rate splitting subject to uh, uh, average power constraints, where what we optimize here are just the precode of the private message or the private streams, while here we optimize the precode of the private streams plus the common streams, as well as the message splits or the rate uh, that is allocated to each of those different uh, users in the common stream. How do we tackle this? We can use um, weighted uh, uh, MMSC uh, optimization approach that is, uh, has been shown to be efficient to handle uh, some rate problems. So uh, that was for one layer rate splitting. If we have uh, multi-layer rate splittings, for instance, uh, we have a generalized rate splitting. This is an example in the three user case. We have again a weighted sum rate maximization. What is this part is the rate of user K that is actually coming from multiple contributions from its private streams, but also from the different uh, common streams that actually it has to decode. And we have an optimization over the precoders and how we optimize the split of the common stream. And so we have here multiple constraints that says that the common stream that has to be decoded by user one, two, three is actually has to be uh, decoded by those three users. And so similarly, we have the common stream for user one and two that has to be decoded by user one and two, um, user one and three, and user two and three. So those three actually equivalent to what we had here, but we have multiple of them because we have multiple common streams. Uh, average power constraints, and we have here potentially, this is a quality of constraint that says that 
the rate of a certain users has to be larger than a minimum threshold. This is to guarantee some quality of service constraint on top of uh, maximizing the weighted uh, sum weights. Right, so uh, this kind of optimization problem here is uh, what we have used in uh, previous slides uh, to optimize the system. So here, when we designed those uh, optimize the systems here. We looked at this optimization framework. Similarly here, this is based on this weighted sum rate optimization. Uh, and similarly here, everything is based on this uh, weighted sum rate maximization based on uh, WMMSC uh, optimization framework. Uh, if you're interested, you can refer to the paper for the details of the optimization. Okay, moving on to the imperfect CSIT. Um, the, the scenario is more complicated because of um, the imperfect CSIT actually induce uh, a, um, or leads to a stochastic optimization problem. And so here in this case, we want to maximize the ergodic sum rate. And why it has to be ergodic is because we want to guarantee achievable uh, rates. Uh, and so the challenge is that those instantaneous rates when we have in perfect CSIT are not necessarily achievable. And this is why we have to look at ergodic uh, rates. Now we can show that uh, ergodic sum rate maximization from a precoder design perspective can be converted into an average sum rate maximization. So what we do here, we design the precoders for a given estimate of the channels to maximize an average uh, sum rate. So what is this average sum rate? is given by here. It's the uh, average rate of the common part, the common stream, plus the sum of the average rate of the private streams. And so what are these average rates that are denoted by a bar on top? They are given as follows. The average rate of the common streams um, is given by a certain rate, and we take the conditioned expectation over the channel given the uh, estimate of h that we know. And similarly, we have this for the private rate here. So given an estimate of the, ch the, the, the channel, so the channel estimate, we take an expectation of the instantaneous rate uh, over the distribution of h, or in other words, over the distribution of the error. And what we want to maximize here is we want to maximize this average sum rate over the precoders, we want to find the best precoders that maximize this, and then we want to find uh, how to split the messages and what is the power location and the rate that we need to allocate to the common stream in order to maximize this uh, average sum rate. And so similar to what we had earlier on, we have to make sure that the rate of the common streams is decodable by all the users, and this is reflected by this constraint here. And then we have the average power constraint as usual. Now, similar to what we had with the perfect CSIT, this is a marginal uh, problem than when we have no rate splitting. When we have no rate splitting, essentially we turn off the common streams, we turn off this constraint here, we remove that, and we have a maximization of an average sum rate over all possible precoders of the private streams, and we subject to an average power constraint. So this leads to a stochastic optimization problem because of those expectations uh, here. Um, and the way we, the way this problem can be tackled is by extending the WMMSC approach uh, into a stochastic version of it, uh, where we combine WMMSC with um, uh, sample average approximation method to, approx uh, to find an approximation of those uh, average uh, rates. And so this is an example of the simulation results that we obtain from this. This is something I have illustrated already in uh, a previous section. Um, so by solving this problem here, by, extend, by using this framework and by extending it slightly to a, a, a ergodic sum rate, but a weighted uh, sum rate version of this, essentially we can solve the ergodic rate region and we can obtain those uh, no rate splitting uh, rate region, ergodic rate region and the rate splitting ergodic rate region. And so what we see here on this boundary 
the rate that is allocated to the common streams and the split of the messages among the, the, the two users changes uh, as we move along this boundary here. Another problem uh, of uh, imperfect CSIT is a robust maximum fairness. Um, and so this is another problem, a different problem than the uh, weighted sum rate or the ergodic sum rate we had earlier on here. What we try to do is to maximize the minimum rate among the different users. And so the way that we model the um, error here can be different as well. In these specific scenarios, we look at errors here that are bounded. So the norm of that error is actually bounded. So it's contained within a certain ball or a certain sphere that has a certain radius. Um, and so what we try to do here is to look at uh, maximizing the worst case rate. So the worst case rate for the common and the private is given by um, the rate, the, the minimum rate for all possible channels that actually uh, contain within this field. So we know the channels, we know the estimate, we don't know this error. And so we know that the channels will actually, the true channels will lie within a certain sphere. And so we want to make sure that the rate, so we have to uh, um, transmit at rates that are such that they are achievable whatever channels that may be contained within this uh, sphere. And so this is why we uh, maximize uh, worst case rates where the worst case means uh, minimum over all possible channels within that sphere. And so here, similar to when we do weighted sum rate, um, we actually have to split the different messages into uh, common and private parts. So those actually the common parts and the private parts are included into common stream and private streams. And generally speaking here, similar to the weighted sum rate, splitting all the messages is uh, very helpful to boost the performance. And so what is the problem we end up with is the following. We have uh, here our rate. Uh, uh, and we see again, we perform rate splitting. We have the rate of the, the, the private parts, the rate of the common parts, and we have a maximum problem here. We try to minimize, we try to maximize the rate over the minimum over all the users. And we subject to an achievability constraint. Again, that the rate of the common stream has to be decoded by all the users. Um, and uh, the no rate splitting, similarly to what we had in the previous case, is obtained by turning off again these uh, common parts. We do not allocate any power to the common streams. And so this constraint disappears and we only optimize over the private streams. And so we end up with the classical max mean fairness problem that we have in no rate splitting um, scenarios. So whenever we develop a framework for the rate splitting, by default, it solves also the problem for no rate splitting. So the uh, multi-user linear precoding and potentially the uh, norma as well, since the schemes is in general more general than um, uh, SDMA multi-user linear precoding and norma. So this is an example of um, with splitting performance that I've seen earlier, I've shown earlier on, this is a maximum fairness. So this rate here corresponds to the maximum uh, minimum rate um, among all the users uh, for rate splitting and no rate splitting. Here, no rate splitting refers to uh, multi-user linear precoding. And we have here uh, an error, uh, the, 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 the channel estimation error is contained within a ball that has a certain radius that is given by uh, this uh, value here. And so I have shown uh, before, uh, rate splitting does not incur any situation uh, in contrast with the no rate splitting. The next section six is about physical layer design and link level simulations. So let's start with the physical layer design. So, so far in all the previous sections, uh, whenever we were uh, designing the or evaluating the rate or, or optimizing the precoders, we always assume that uh, we have infinite block length and we have Gaussian inputs. 
And so we were using essentially Shannon expression log two one plus uh, SNR. In um, in this section, we try to depart from uh, this Gaussian signaling and try to see how we can actually design a real uh, physical layer for weight splitting. So our transmitter and receiver architectures as follows. This is an architecture for um, a two user weight splitting. And so we have here the um, encoding of the private, uh, the common stream, and we have the private stream for user one, the private stream for user two. At the receiver, we have two receivers, two users, uh, user one receiver and user two receiver. And so what we have here, actually the, um, the messages W1 and W2 have been split into a common part and a private part. So actually this, those are the two common parts from uh, message of user one and user two. Uh, and those are the private part of the message of user one and user two. And so what we see here is that we have uh, a message split that needs to be designed. Then we actually um, encode those uh, messages, the common message and the private one, we encode them. And the way we do this in the simulation I will show you in a moment is using polar codes. So polar codes are used for the common and the private streams. Uh, we have an interleaver and then we have uh, modulation and modulation I chose it from finite constellation modulations, uh, QPSK, 16 QAM, 64 QAM and 256 uh, QAM. And then we have the precoder. The precoder is designed uh, following the uh, precoder optimization procedure that I've uh, shown earlier on in the previous section. And so we use a WMMSC uh, optimization framework uh, based on imperfect CSIT to optimize those precoders, along with the rate uh, of the common streams and the private streams. And so uh, since we don't use Gaussian signaling, what we need to do is adaptive modulation and coding and find what is the best modulation and what is the best coding rate such that uh, we uh, can um, come as close as possible to the performance that we obtain from the, um, the optimization. So the precoder optimization come from the optimization, assuming we have Gaussian signaling, but then we have an adaptive modulation encoding that try to find what is the most suitable modulation encoding uh, for this uh, specific uh, channel realization and uh, estimation uh, errors. At the receiver, we have to design the receiver, the decoder, um, so the the, the polar decoder and the uh, SIC uh, receiver. And so because we have a finite block length here, the SIC may be imperfect. We may have some uh, errors when we decode the common streams and that may lead to error propagation onto the private streams. So this is incorporated into the framework as well uh, and is inevitable in a way simply because we have a finite uh, block length. Okay, so if we design all those uh, different strategies, then what we can end up with essentially results on the throughput. Uh, so correctly decoded uh, bits, bits per second per hertz versus SNR. And so this is here, we compare three different schemes, rate splitting or rate splitting multiple access, SDMA and NOMA. And we have a, a CSIT inaccuracy uh, that is given by alpha e equal to 0 0.6. So this is the same alpha as what we had in the DOF, um, <clears throat> uh, the DOF model. So the 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 strength of the, or the power of the CSIT error is scales as p to the power minus uh, 0 0.6. Uh, we don't have a quality of service constraint in the optimization problem. We have two user, two transmit antennas. So the dashed lines are actually the uh, upper bound that we can get on the rate, which are actually the uh, using the Shannon bound. So those are actually the same results as what we had in the previous section. It assumes we have Gaussian signaling and a rate that is given by log to one plus uh, SNR. And the precoders have been optimized across all those three schemes. So the blue one is rate splitting, 
the red one is STMA and the green one is NOMA. The, um, the solid lines are the performance we get with the actual link level simulation where we now uh, implement this entire uh, transmitter and receiver architecture using those modulations, uh, polar codes for uh, the private and common streams and the entire uh, receivers here. And so we see that we have a performance drop compared to the Shannon bound, which is normal because we use finite uh, block lengths. And so if we want to close that gap, we have to actually increase further the length of, uh, of, of the, the, the code block. Um, but we see that the gain of rate splitting uh, using Shannon bounds actually is reflected when we use uh, finite constellation and finite block lengths. We uh, observe a significant gain of rate splitting over SDMA and NOMA. Um, one interesting observation is what's happening here with SDMA. We see that actually SDMA is better than NOMA, and here SDMA seems to saturate. And the reason for this is because at high SNR, uh, SDMA has a tendency to have some of the streams. So we have two streams here. One of the two streams essentially is um, bounded. The rate of that stream is bounded because of the finite constellation that we have. So it reached the highest uh, constellation level. Um, and um, and it can go any higher than that. While with rate splitting, we don't have this issue because the rate seems to be better balanced between uh, the private rate and the common rate, um, and so is not capped by uh, or is not limited um, by the uh, finite spectral efficiency of the largest constellation size. So what we observe from this is that rate splitting is more robust and significantly outperforms uh, SDMA and NOMA. Keep in mind here, in terms of complexity, what complexity we have at the receiver is NOMA and uh, rate splitting have the same receiver complexity. They both rely on SIC. Um, so this is a higher complexity that we have in SDMA, but otherwise um, the gain is, is, is uh, observed. So we have uh, slightly higher complexity uh, but we have uh, better performance. Section seven is about um, application of rate splitting and extension of rate splitting. And so here what we will look at is how rate splitting that uh, we have talked about extensively now in, in, in this tutorial can be used to tackle numerous problems in modern wireless uh, network. So we look at the problem of quantized feedback, we would look at massive MIMO, we look at multi-cell network, uh, overloaded scenarios for cellular IoT, multi-group multicast, uh, millimeter wave and, and other systems. So uh, this is an overview of some scenarios that we're going to look at. Um, and um, so the first one is the classical interference channel that uh, was studied by Kalel and Han Kobayashi a long time ago that was for the interference channel, uh, the two user size with interference channels. And in the past, uh, the past few years, um, the use of rate splitting uh, uh, was, or the benefit of rate splitting was discovered for multi-antenna scenarios, and especially for these multi-antenna broadcast channels. And so all those applications that we have here actually related to the use of rate splitting in multi-antenna context, and many of them are for the uh, multi-antenna broadcast channels. So the uh, first one here is this multi-user MISO, multi-user MIMO with partial CSIT, can be quantized CSI. We can have scenarios where we have multi-cell, uh, with multiple antennas, we can have massive MIMO where we have partial CSIT in FDD or in TDD. Um, in FDD, maybe because of feedback. In TDD, we have partial CSIT because of pilot contaminations. Um, we have a millimeter wave system with limited feedback. We can have um, in, uh, wireless information power transfer, and we see uh, rate splitting can be used there to. Uh, boost the performance of these kind of systems. 
in um, multi-point joint transmission, in non-orthogonal unicast, in multicast, in multi-group multicast, and with satellite applications, satellite systems, and in uh, coded caching scenarios, uh, and many other uh, applications. So we'll look at some of those uh, now in this section. So the first one we look at is when we do multi-user MIMO uh, and we have quantized feedback. Now quantized feedback is used in practice uh, heavily, it's used in 4G and 5G, it's used in FDD system definitely, but it can also be used in TDD uh, because sometimes the reciprocity of the RF chains cannot be guaranteed and that's why it's been popular to use uh, also uh, quantized feedback in TDD system. So the way it works is that we have a uh, channel uh, state information, channel vector, for instance, for user K, and we use a code book that is used to quantize that, um, that vector using uh, B bits. And this uh, quantized version of the channels using B bits is um, reported to uh, the transmitter, and the transmitter then have an estimate of these uh, channel vectors. And so since this uh, estimate is not the same as the true channels, we have a quantization. Uh, we have imperfect CSIT due to the quantization error. So this is an illustration of what's happening uh, when we have uh, three or four different schemes. So the, the first one is uh, zero forcing beam forming. So we have in red here, the use of zero forcing beam forming with quantized feedback. And we assume here we have four transmit antennas, two users, and we have 15 bits of uh, feedback uh, for quantization. And so we see that uh, uh, this number of bits of feedback is used whatever the SNR. And so at some SNR, at some points, the sum rate of zero forcing beam forming um, or multi-user linear precoding saturates. And this is a phenomenon actually I highlighted uh, earlier on in this tutorial, it's a well-known uh, behavior, and this is a typical problem that we can experience in a 4G, 5G systems because the number of feedback peaks is, is constant, whatever the SNR. Um, so uh, another approach is to use uh, OMA, or Automobile Multiple Access, or TDMA, and so we see that in that case we skilled one user at a time, and so it doesn't work well uh, for a wide range of SNR, but at very high SNR it does not saturate. Uh, it does not saturate because there is no interference, and that's why it's actually outperformed zero forcing beam forming. Uh, and so what you have in a system like 4G, 5G is a dynamic switching between single user or TDMA and multi-user, which is uh, rate splitting, uh, sorry, which is zero forcing. And so if you do a dynamic switching between the two, you get that green, that green curve. Um, now the rate splitting is this blue line here, right? What we see here is that uh, we have uh, performance that outperforms all those three different schemes and that has a SNR gain here of uh, five, five, six, seven dBs at high SNR. Uh, the, uh, that comes from the fact that uh, rate splitting essentially uh, is more robust to imperfect CSIT, specifically here more robust to quantize feedback. So this benefit uh, of this robustness either increase the sum rate or we can do this uh, differently. We can say for a smaller code book size, we can maintain the same performance as what we have currently in 4G, 5G using dynamic switching, SU, MIMO switching, but with a smaller code book size. This is also possible. So it can save either improve the performance or on the other hand, it can uh, reduce the feedback overhead, which is a very important uh, practical um, issue in, in real system design. Um, another uh, scenario is massive MIMO. So in, in massive MIMO, we, uh, massive MIMO requires a huge demand uh, for accurate CSI at the transmitter. Um, and so this is an example here of massive MIMO. We have many transmit antennas here and want to serve many users. Um, and so what we can do here, uh, we can typically, uh, uh, th those users, the, the CSI of those users is reported to the transmitter, it may not be perfect, and so the transmitter is will be limited and interference will occur within the networks because of the imperfect CSIT. And so we can use rate splitting here to tackle this problem. Now the classical approach in multi-user MIMO, in the massive MIMO, especially when we have FDD system, is to use um, a two-tier precoding. And two-tier precoding works as follows. We divide users into groups like this, 
um, and users experience similar second order statistics are paired together. And so we have a first tier pre-coder that is relies on the second order statistics of these groups and try to design a first pre-coder BG. And what this does effectively, uh, it tries to eliminate the interference between the different groups by using second order statistics. And then once we use the, this first tier precoder, essentially effectively, we can design a digital precoder and second tier precoder that, uh, that operates on precoded channels after the, the first tier precoder. And this precoder here tries to tackle the uh, multi-user interference within each group. So the first tier precoder is really tries to manage interference between groups using second order statistics. The second uh, tier precoder here tries to rely on the instantaneous CSI feedback to manage the interference between, between the groups. Right, now the problem with this is that we have, uh, if we cannot manage the interference or reduce uh, or, or um, uh, suppress the interference efficiently between groups, we end up with intergroup interference. And if we have imperfect CSIT in each of those groups, because of quantized feedback, for instance, or other CSI uh, channel estimation errors, essentially we have uh, multi-user interference within each group. So we can use rate splitting here to tackle this problem of uh, intergroup interference here and interference within each of those groups. And so how we can do this is by using a two-tier uh, rate splitting. We could use a uh, one-layer rate splitting. This is a first strategy that could be used. So we could have, for instance, here, one common method that is used to tackle the interference between all those nine users. And on top of this, we have nine private streams. Uh, but we can do something better than that, is to have uh, three groups. And so having a common message in each of those groups whose objective is to tackle the multi-user interference that is seen within each group. And then we have a system common message here that is decoded by all those nine users that is used to tackle the interference between those different groups. So we have one common message that is used to tackle the interference between the group, and we have three group uh, common message that is used to tackle the interference within each group. And this is what we see here with this two-layer rate splitting, also called hierarchical rate splitting. Uh, I have highlighted this uh, strategy already in the context of rate splitting multiple access. And the way it works here is that we have a system common message here that would be, for instance, decoded by those nine users. And we have here a group common message that is every time decoded by users in specific group G. And so if we have three groups here, we have three group common message and each user's uh, all users in that specific group has to decode that specific group common message. And so each user, if I take this user here, would first decode a system common message that is actually uh, has to be decoded by all, and then would decode his own group common message that has to be decoded by those three users here, and then would decode his own private streams. Okay, so this is the way it works. So we have a system common message, a group common message, and then the private messages. And we can design the precoders uh, the, the two tier precoder, so the first tier precoder, the second tier precoder, and the precoder of the common uh, message such that, or the common stream such that we can manage the group uh, efficiently. And this is uh, an illustration of what we can get here in this FDD massive MIMO. We have uh, 100 transmit antennas, we have 12 users, we have a certain CSIT quality that is uh, given by a certain parameter here. Uh, and we have two different scenarios. The first scenario is when we have disjoint eigen uh, subspace. So what that means is that we can potentially use second order statistics to fully separate uh, these groups and these groups and these groups. So we can fully eliminate the intergroup interference, right? And so if we can fully eliminate the intergroup uh, interference, um, we can have some uh, performance gain, obviously, because one source of interference is eliminated. But we have imperfect channel state information, the transmitter, and so that means that we are going to have interference within each of those groups because the, the transmitter will not be able to fully suppress interference to the other users because of the uh, imperfect knowledge of the CSI, instantaneous CSI the transmitter. Right, so, um, how would that work here? We have the blue one is a classical uh, two-tier two -tier precoder that is classically used in the academic literature on massive MIMO. And what we have here in red is actually the use of this hierarchical rate splitting. 
And so in this specific case, which message uh, will be primarily useful? Well, it will be primarily those ones because the system common message is used to tackle the interference between groups. But in this case, since the groups are disjoint, there would be very little uh, interference between groups. And so this system common message is likely to be uh, turned off, but the group common message will be, uh, will be used. This is a different scenario with overlapping egg and subspace. That means that uh, we cannot use a second order statistics to separate the different groups together. So the different groups will interfere with each other. And so on top of having in perfect CSIT, we have intergroup interference. And so in this case, this system common message will be very useful to tackle the intergroup interference. And so what we see is that depending on the severity of the imperfect CSIT, depending on the severity of the intergroup interference, essentially, we can adjust how much power we allocate to the system common message and how much power we allocate to the group common message as well as to the private messages. Uh, this is um, the same setup, 100 tra uh, transmit antennas, 12 users, same CSIT quality for specific SNRs. And we use, look at here, disjoint egg and subspace. And this is just a representation for two different CSIT qualities. We have a better CSIT quality, a worse CSIT qualities, and four different schemes. So the first one is the classical um, uh, regularized uh, zero forcing beam forming when it is applied to this massive MIMO setup. The yellow one is when we use a two tier precoding uh, in this massive MIMO setup. And we see we have a little gain here over the blue one uh, by using two tier precoding. This is a one layer rate splitting. And what we see here is that the basic rate splitting architecture that has very tiny gain here. And the reason for this that it has very tiny gain is because there are 12 users in this setup. This common stream has to be decoded by 12 users. Now, this hierarchical rate splitting gives significant gain over all those three baseline and because it really adjusts uh, the how to split the messages between the common part uh, the group common part and the system common part um, and so in this specific setup here when we have disjoint, disjoint egg and subspace the really useful common message are really those one this one is would be less useful and this one is only decoded by three users and so that means actually the rate of that common message will also be uh, larger. And so we see here that, again, rate splitting is very robust. Uh, even though we have uh, 100 transmit antennas, we have very underloaded scenarios. We have many more antennas than the number of users. Well, rate splitting gives significant performance gain because of the uh, imperfect uh, CSIT that we have in the system. Uh, moving on to TDD massive MIMO. So in TDD massive MIMO, the problem is pilot contamination. And that comes from the fact that uh, the user, uh, uh, multiple user can transmit the same pilot and that contaminates uh, other users' uh, channel estimates. Um, and so here what we look at is the design of a single uh, cell massive MIMO where uh, the users in that cells use the same pilot sequence to perform channel estimation. And we have here uh, the average spectral efficiency versus the transmit power with 100 transmit antennas. We have 10 users. Here we have average some spectral efficiencies versus the number of transmit antennas uh, for transmit power 20 dB. The, the red one is without using rate splitting. So this is a classical multi-user linear precoding that is used in massive MIMO. Um, and the blue one is when we have rate splitting. And so what we see here is that as the transmit power increase at the transmitter here, uh, essentially the SNR of the user will increase. Well, we experience a saturation when we have no rate splitting. And this is because the quality of the estimates becomes uh, limited because of pilot contamination, but rate splitting is able to actually uh, keep increasing the sum rate uh, because it's inherently robust to imperfect uh, channel state information that transmitter. And so here as a function of the number of antennas, we see actually the gain of rate splitting versus no rate splitting or conventional strategy, conventional multi-user MIMO, is actually uh, appears for a very wide range of the number of antennas, whether we have small number of antennas or all the way to a large number of antennas in this system uh, setup, even though we have uh, TDD. And this is again due to the fact that we have pilot contamination and because rate splitting is inherently robust to imperfect CSIT and one, one uh, possible source 
of Infotech CSIT is pilot contamination. Moving on to multi-cell networks, um, we can have two different scenarios here, coordination and cooperation. So this is an example of coordination where we have three uh, different transmitters with multiple antennas, three different users, and you can see those three links as three different cells in the cellular network, and they interfere with each other. And so um, we have here a scenarios where uh, we have different CSIT quality across those different links. And so, for instance, the quality of the CSI in red can be different than the CSIT quality in green. And so the, that may be due to um, the way the user allocated and so the disparity of channel strength and so on. And so what we can design here is actually a rate splitting that adjusts itself to this uh, CSIT pattern. The CSIT pattern tells you what is the CSIT quality between a given transmitter and given and, and receivers. So the, between the transmitter one and those three receivers, between transmitter two and those three receivers, between transmitter three and those three receivers. And as a function of this CSIT quality, essentially the design of the rate splitting changes um, and the split of the messages change. And here we actually can have uh, one layer rate splitting or multiple layer rate splitting. Um, cooperation is when all those different cells those three cells fully cooperate with each other. And so um, essentially they form a giant MIMO array. And so the giant multi-antenna broadcast channels. And in contrast to the single cell rate splitting here, what we see is that uh, given users here, will see multiple antennas coming from multiple cells, but we're gonna have a disparity of channel strength among those different uh, antennas. So uh, the strengths of uh, the, 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 the channels from um, to the first base station is likely to be stronger than to the second base station. Um, so this is um, a disparity of channel strength among base stations, and we also have disparity of channel strength among users. And so here we can design the rate splitting so that it adjusts to this double disparity of channel strength among users and among base stations uh, using the framework that we have looked at. And so depending on the CSIT quality uh, and depending on the, um, the disparity of channel strength uh, among users and among cells, the rate splitting can adapt itself. Uh, this is another scenario, uh, overloaded uh, systems where we have, uh, especially designed for IOTs, where we have a transmitters equipped with M antennas and we have multiple users. But we have a case where we have specifically more users than the number of transmitter antennas. And so one way to deal with this is to uh, use uh, scheduled users using orthogonal uh, resources. And so for instance, if I have two transmit antennas, I could pair two users together, serve them together, and the third user would be served on an orthogonal resource, for instance, a different uh, time slot. Um, so what we consider here is a scenario where we have a, a heterogeneous device. We could have device that actually have a good CSIT quality or some form of CSI feedback. Uh, and then we have device that are very simple, like IoT device that have very low quality of CSI feedback. And the question is, how can we serve them in an efficient manner altogether? Um, and so this is uh, a toy example here. We have a system with two transmit antennas, three users, and we have the first two users actually uh, are users that are actually quite robust. And so they can perform channel estimation. They can report some form of CSI to the transmitter. And so the transmitter has some uh, knowledge of the CSI of those users. The third user is an IoT users. It may not have maybe a CSI feedback capability. And so the transmitter has a very low quality estimate of this CSI. So this uh, alpha for this uh, user is uh, much lower than for the, the first two users. And the question is how do we serve those three users when we have only two antennas? And so we can have uh, two approach here. The first approach would be we do a time partitioning where we actually serve the first two users in the first uh, time portion using rate splitting. So we have the private part here of user one and two, 
and the, the common parts of user one and two. And then we serve the third user, the IoT user, in the third time suite, in, a, in the second time suite, so orthogonal to the first one. Or we could have a different approach, which says, which is a power partitioning, and so that performs rate splitting among those two users, the two users that has CSI feedback with uh, CSI quality alpha. And then we reserve some power level here uh, where we actually superimpose the message for the third users, right? So we have a superposition of rate splitting here and uh, messages of, uh, with uh, no CSI quality, right, in the power domain. So what we can show is that this uh, power partitioning strategy that integrates superposition coding and rate splitting here is actually the optimal strategy in terms of degrees of freedom uh, region when we have this uh, mixture of CSIT quality between uh, alpha users and uh, zero uh, users, zero CSIT quality users. And this is what we can see here in this figure. So the green line is the conventional time partitioning, but uh, it's already a more advanced version of conventional time partitioning in the sense that we perform weight splitting in the first time slot, and we perform um, um, so we perform weight splitting in the first time slot, like here. We perform weight splitting among those two users, and then we have a second time slot where we transmit to the IoT user separately. And so here what we have is the power partitioning that integrates, that superposing the power domain, rate splitting, and the message for the third users. And depending on the disparity of channel strength, essentially the performance changes, but we can see the power partitioning provides quite a big gain over this uh, uh, time partitioning approach. And so this is very helpful in uh, overloaded and massive uh, cellular IoT, where we can imagine that now we have many more than just uh, three users. And the question is how we actually integrate and make use of the CSIT uh, in the most efficient way by um, superimposing them on top of each, each other. Another scenario is multi-group multicast. So um, for instance, here we have a transmitter with multiple antennas and we have multiple groups and each group is made of potentially one or multiple users. And uh, multi-group multicast has received some attention uh, recently uh, because it's actually related uh, to uh, caching, it's related to content delivery. And so for instance, here you can pair users together in the same group if they actually request the same, um, the same uh, information, for instance, right? So what we want to do here is uh, for instance, to group users. And so we have uh, G message that have to be delivered, one message for the group one, one message for group two, one message for group G, and all the users in group G, they're essentially interested in the message uh, that is in, uh, transmitted to that group. Um, and this scenario also applies to satellite communication. So this is something we will see uh, later on in this section as well. So the classical beamforming problem here is we have uh, G messages, W1 to WG, intended to group one to group G. They encoded into G streams, S1 to SG, and they are precoded by a certain precoding. And so the, the way to design uh, those precoders conventionally uh, is, uh, or one way of doing it is using uh, maximum fairness. And so what we try to do here we try to design the precoders so that we maximize the minimum rate among all the users. So the minimum rate among all groups and all users in each group, subject to an average power constraint. And so this is something that can be do, can 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 be done. Um, but there is an issue when we have overloaded systems. So we if we have the number of antennas here is limited compared to the number of users we have there then we have major problem with classical uh, beam forming like this, because we don't have enough antennas and enough resource there at the transmitter to perform interference nulling. And so what will happen is that this max mean uh, rate will saturate uh, very quickly. And so this occurs 
resaturation occurs even when we have perfect CSIT because of the intergroup interference. And so this is an example here uh, of uh, two different scenarios. We have six users and three groups, one user in group one, two users in group two, three users in group three, and we have a different number of transmitter antennas. So if we have six antennas at the transmitter and we have six users, we see that using rate splitting or no rate splitting does not change much here in this setup with perfect CSIT. Um, because we have enough antenna to manage the uh, intergroup interference. But as the number of antennas decreases at the transmitter, we see that the gap increases between rate splitting and no rate splitting. And so in this scenario here, when we have two transmitter antennas and six users, uh, we have a significant gap between rate splitting and no rate splitting. The no rate splitting saturates very quickly because of the lack of capability to manage interference and uh, and to null interference between those different groups. And the rate splitting, on the other hand, because it's robust to uh, multi-user interference, will adjust how to split the messages to those different groups. And so it will take those um, G messages, split them into common and private parts. And so instead of transmitting G streams, it will transmit G plus one streams, one common stream and G private streams. And this leads to uh, a significant enhancement in the maximum rate. Another example here is when we have four transmit antennas and two users per group, uh, but now we, we have three groups and four groups. And so what we see here is that when we have three groups, we have this performance here. Red is rate splitting, blue here is rate splitting. When we have uh, three groups, uh, and we see the significant gap between those two, simply because um, with three groups and four transmit antennas, we don't have enough antennas to perform this interference nulling. And so that's why the sum rates end up uh, saturating here with no rate splitting, why the rate splitting always outperform significantly the no rate splitting. If we increase the number of groups, the intergroup interference is becoming even more severe. And so the rate decreases, the maximum rate decreases, uh, but again, the no rate splitting saturates, but the rate splitting does not uh, saturate. So it really shows how rate splitting is very robust to mitigate intergroup interference here in this uh, multi-group, multicast scenario. Another interesting application is uh, millimeter wave systems. And so this is uh, also an important uh, scenario in uh, 5G communications where transmission is done in the millimeter wave frequency band, for instance, 28 gigahertz. And at those frequencies, it's very difficult to perform fully digital processing. So typically we have a digital uh, processing part and we have an analog processing part. And so we can have a digital precoder and we have an analog precoder and we have a limited number of RF chains. So the number of RF chain is typically smaller than the number of transmit antennas and that enables to decrease the complexity and the cost of the transmitter. Um, now having two stage recorders here and given the large passwords that we have in millimeter wave systems, the whole CSI acquisition also differs from classical uh, lower band uh, communication or multi antenna communication systems. So classical way of acquiring the channels is as follows. We first transmit pilots channel uh, state information reference uh, uh, signals. Um, um, and those ones are used to estimate the CSI and report the CSI back to the transmitter. And then there is some demodulation reference signals that are transmitted to perform um, data transmission and demodulation at the time of data transmissions. And um, in millimeter wave, on the other hand, uh, because of the large pass loss, typically we have fir first a beam search. So the CSI is uh, reference signals actually are somehow precoded through a beam search, uh, through a precoded beams, and then we could have a demodulation reference signals and then data transmissions. The most common way is to do a beam search first. Then once we have an estimated beam, we actually beam form the CSI uh, reference signal using that beam form, uh, beam former obtained from the beam search, and then we perform uh, demodulation reference signals, and then we have data transmissions. Now, having multiple stage here is actually leads to a higher signaling uh, and a higher feedback uh, overhead 
uh, and also some latency. And so those are two different approaches. Um, and so what we can see here from these uh, figures is that the rate splitting uh, is a very uh, promising strategy to boost the rate, but also to save overhead and therefore latency also uh, in terms of reducing the number of training and feedback needed in millimeter wave. So where do we see this is the following one. The blue one is when we have no rate splitting, but using only one stage feedback. So it's this scenario here where you have a beam search first and using that beam search, we use the selected beams in order to transmit the uh, demodulation reference signals and, and performs a data transmission. And so uh, the science curve here is when we have one stage feedback, but using rate splitting. And we see that the rate splitting uh, boosts the performance compared to the no rate splitting. Now we can use two stage feedback as well. So two stage feedback is the green one and the purple one here. The green one is without rate splitting. The purple one is with rate splitting. And again, the rate splitting performs, uh, performs and, uh, provides significant performance enhancement over no rate splitting. So in both cases where we have one stage feedback, and two stage feedback. Interestingly as well, is we see that the no rate splitting with one stage feedback achieves slightly better performance than the rate splitting with one stage feedback. So between those two curves here, this one has a much higher signaling overhead and much higher latency than this one. So we can see another benefit of rate splitting. Uh, instead of boosting the rate, it actually can save the second stage uh, channel training and feedback, and as a consequence, reduce the latency in the network. Another benefit of rate splitting is when we have hardware impairment. So this is an example here where we have uh, uh, RF and uh, phase noise impairments. And so phase noise actually uh, leads to some form of imperfect CSIT because we can estimate the chance perfectly on the uplink, for instance, but if there is some phase noise um, uh, uh, on the downlink uh, or between the uplink chains and the downlink chain, essentially uh, the, um, the CSI that the uh, transmitter will uh, acquire uh, will actually be effectively different from the uh, the true CSI of the channels. And so it leads to a form of imperfect CSIT that is now here originating from the phase nodes. And so example here, we have uh, here the cyan curves and the green curve. We have uh, uh, the cyan curves is no rate splitting. The green curve is rate splitting. And the gap here between the two is again due to the fact that rate splitting is much more uh, robust to imperfect CSIT in this specific case due to uh, phase noise. Um, so this is uh, rate splitting in the presence of phase noise. This is no rate splitting in the presence of phase noise. And we see the significant gap. And we have the same here for different scenarios where we have also phase noise. Um, but here we have perfect CSIT on the uplink and phase noise. Here we have imperfect CSIT. Uh, and on top of this, we have uh, phase noise. So the main message here is that ray splitting can also be used to mitigate uh, phase noise impairment. And how, instead of having a rate that saturates at high SNR here for no ray splitting, we have a rate that keeps increasing with the SNR. Another application of rate splitting is when we perform non-orthogonal unicast and multicast transmission. So unicast refers to the case where we have a one-to-one -one message transmission. So we have a message W1 that has to be, that is really intended to a uh, user one, for instance. Multicast is when we have one-to-many. A uh, given message that is transmitted actually is intended to multiple users. And so in uh, 4G and 5G, there is an increasing um, demand for a mixture of services. And so mixture of unicast, multicast, broadcast. Um, and so one way of doing this is to separate unicast and multicast onto orthogonal resources. Um, but another way is to superpose them or superimpose them in the power domain in a non-orthogonal manner. And so the question is how to do that, because if we superimpose them uh, in the power domain, then we have interference between the unicast streams intended to multiple uh, uh, different receivers, but also we have interference between the multicast and the unicast. 
Um, and so this can have lots of application in beyond 5G because of the scarcity of the radio resources uh, and the heterogeneity in, uh, of the application, of the traffics and the services. And it also finds application in digital uh, television systems uh, and the so-called layered division multiplexing. So what is a, a one way of, of doing it if we don't want to simply do orthogonalization and treat unicast and multicast onto two orthogonal resources? A first thing we could do is to superimpose them in the power domain and transmit K unicast uh, message. We have uh, unicast W1 to WK and then we have a multicast message W0. So W0 is actually intended to all those K users. W1 to WK is intended respectively to user 1 to user K. And so classically what we could do is to encode those K plus 1 message into K plus 1 streams and then performs SIC at the receiver where each user decodes the multicast uh, message first, performs SIC, and then decode his intended uh, unicast uh, streams. Right, so this draws some similarity with rate splitting, but it's not the same thing. The important uh, difference here is that W0 here is a multicast message that is genuinely intended to all those K users, right? This is different from the common streams that we had in rate splitting. The common stream we had in rate splitting is decoded by all the users, but is intended to one of those users or to a subset of those users. The reason why all the users had to decode the common stream is because of is for uh, interference management purposes. This is a different motivation, different design than this uh, non orthogonal multicast uh, unicast transmission here, where the common, the multicast uh, stream here is uh, decoded by all the users and actually intended to all the users. Now we can do rate splitting in this non orthogonal unicast multicast. And how can we do this is as follows. We now take those K unicast messages and the multicast message W0, and we split the K unicast messages into two parts, common part, private part. We combine those common parts together with the multicast message into um, a super common message. And we encode this into these common streams or, or, or streams as zero. And then the private parts of the unicast are encoded into the private streams. And what we do at the receiver, we do something similar to what we had here on the left. We first decode this stream as zero. And so each receiver, what it will do, it will retrieve an estimate of the multicast message, and it will also retrieve an estimate of the part of its unicast that has been encoded into the uh, super common uh, message. So it will retrieve W0, but it will also retrieve it's the part that actually of the unicast that is intended to itself. Then performs SIC and retrieve the private parts. So what we see here is that this is a one layer rate splitting architecture for non-orthogonal unicast multicast transmission. And the SIC here is used much more efficiently than in the left side. Both receivers use one SIC. So they both have the same complexity at the receiver, but this one here use the SIC for double purpose to separate the unicast and multicast but also to better manage the interference between the unicast streams. This is in contrast to this one here, where the SIC is used to separate the multicast from the unicast, but is not used to manage the interference between the unicast streams. So the rate splitting architecture here will provide rate performance and quality of service uh, enhancement at no extra cost for the receivers, because in any case, the SIC has to be used to separate multicast from unicast. In the rate splitting, we just use more efficiently for the dual purpose of separating unicast and multicast, but also for managing the interference between the unicast streams. So this leads to a performance gain. And so here we have three strategies. The, um, the yellow one is NORMA. The uh, green one is uh, multi-user linear precoding. So the green one is actually 
this strategy here, and the red one is weight splitting in this non-orthogonal multicast, uh, non-orthogonal unicast multicast transmission. And we have uh, here uh, rate constraints for the multicast stream. So the multicast streams has to be received at all the receivers with a minimum uh, quality of service constraints. We have four subfigures here, similar to what we had uh, earlier on in this tutorial. As we increase theta, we increase the angle between those two user uh, channel uh, vectors. And what we see is that, again, rate splitting offers a larger rate region, so it enables to deliver a multicast message, but at the same time, better manage the interference between the unicast streams. And this is why it leads to a larger rate uh, region between um, um, between uh, uh, compared to the other two strategies, uh, MULP and NOMA. So uh, all what I have talked about earlier on was uh, primarily for uh, terrestrial systems, but ray splitting can be very helpful to satellite uh, communication systems as well. So this is an example of a satellite communications. We have a transmitter equipped with multiple antennas and we have multiple beams here. So we have a multi-beam satellite system and in each beam we can have multiple users. And the way multi-beam satellite communication works uh, is typically is very uh, similar to a multi-group multicast. And so here in this example here, we have on the, on the right, we have a scenario where we have seven beams and we have 14 users and two user per beams. And so we transmit seven messages uh, to, uh, uh, to seven uh, beams. And in each beams, we have two users and each user in each beam will actually decode one of those seven uh, message, right? Um, so it's very similar to what we had with the multi-group multicast here. Right, but now we have two user in each of those groups. Now the, the propagation on satellite system is very different than for terrestrial, so this leads to a number of changes in the performance. Um, but an additional issue is the imperfect CSIT. So in contrast to what I've talked about earlier on with multi-group multicast, where we looked at the perfect CSIT, here we consider a case where we have imperfect CSIT as well. So we have a satellite system where we have uh, multiple beams, those beams interfere with each other, and on top of this we have imperfect CSIT. And this imperfect CSIT is characterized by this parameter, 0 0.6, which is the alpha that we had earlier on. So we have 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and then we have the case where we have perfect CSIT. And we're looking at maximum fairness rates, and what we see here is that in blue we have the no rate splitting strategy, conventional multi-user linear precoding, um, and the red we have um, rate splitting in this scenario where we have seven beams in this uh, multi-beam satellite systems. And we see again that the rate splitting provides significant gain over the no rate splitting strategies in the event where we have perfect CSIT, so the, the solid lines, but also in the event where we have imperfect CSIT, the dashed line. And so again, that shows the superiority of rate splitting, not in the context of satellite communication, to better manage the interbeam interference, to manage the, uh, to be more robust to uh, CSIT uncertainty, and to also cope with practical constraints that we have in satellite communications. One of them is the per feed constraint that is incorporated into the design here. And the second one is the fact that often satellite systems are overloaded. And so you have more users to serve than the number of, of beams that uh, than we have at the transmitter, at the uh, satellite. Now, another application of uh, rate splitting could be when uh, in scenarios where we have to make the best use of the spectrum, not only for communication, but to do something else. So one example of this could be wireless information and power transfer. 
uh, you have some reference about this in the list of uh, the reference sections. I will not talk about this here, uh, but another application is when we do radar and communication. So essentially, the purpose is to make the best use of the spectrum to do multiple things at the same time. So it could be wireless communication and power transfer. It could be radar transmission and communication. And so in this context where we want to do joint communication and radar, the question is how to define the best strategy to um, enhance the performance of the radar and at the same time enhance the performance of the communication. And so here's an example. We have a multi-antenna uh, array here. We have communication receivers and then we have a target and we want to actually uh, perform uh, radar to that uh, target, radar transmission to that target, um, maximize the performance of that radar uh, transmission. And at the same time, we want to maximize the performance, the rate of all those communication receivers. And there is a trade-off because the radar design and the communication design could be different. And so one way of doing this is to transmit the radar and to transmit the communication on two orthogonal uh, resources. But this is not very efficient, uh, especially in scenarios where we have a limited spectrum and we want to really make use of, of the, uh, make, make the best use of the spectrum. So we may want to actually uh, do a joint transmission of communication and radar jointly, but then we have interference between radar and communication. And the question is, how do we tackle this interference? And so this is an example here of uh, uh, performance of joint communication and radar. On the y-axis, we have a weighted sum rate. So this is the communication performance. And on the x-axis, we have the mean square error, uh, which is the uh, radar uh, performance metric. And we have two strategies. The first one is just to do uh, space division multiple access. So we actually transmit uh, messages here to those key users and we design the beamformer so that we can also perform radar transmission in a certain uh, direction. And so the problem with this is actually SDMA has to manage the interference among the users but at the same time manage the interference that is created uh, to the radar. And so uh, SDMA achieved this trade-off between uh, weighted sum rate and MSC. If we use rate splitting or rate splitting multiple access, what we show is that we make a better use of the private and the common streams, not only to communicate, but also to enhance the uh, radar transmission capability. And so for instance, for a given accuracy of the, the radar, we actually achieve a higher uh, weighted sum rate or for a given weighted sum rate, we actually achieve a better uh, radar uh, performance, right? So the rate splitting here is shown to be uh, very efficient, again, to manage uh, radar communication interference and leads to larger uh, uh, weighted sum rate MSE uh, region. So after those applications of rate splittings, and there are many others that I didn't have a chance to talk about, um, let's go through some conclusion and uh, talk about future challenges and, and pathway to uh, beyond 5G and 6G. So the general observation we can make of uh, rate splitting and rate splitting multiple access, um, the key to performance enhancement is not to be in the regimes and not to design strategies that actually really treating, fully treating interference as noise on one hand or fully decoding interference on the other hand, but rather try to partially decode interference and partially treat interference as noise and adapt how much interference can be partially decoded and how much can be treated in, uh, as noise. And this is really key uh, and that's, uh, that's this uh, property which is enabled by the message split into common and private part is what uh, enables um, this uh, uh, rate splitting to be uh, very flexible and very agile. So um, rate splitting and RSMA can be seen as a robust interference management strategy as well, robust to uh, imperfect CSIT in particular, um, and a very flexible non orthogonal transmission strategy, flexible to um, propagation conditions 
to different type of propagation conditions, to network loads, whether the, the user are aligned with each other or talking to each other, whether they have disparity action strength or not, whether the system is overloaded or underloaded. Um, and race splitting can be seen as an enabler of uh, a powerful enabler of a unified multiple access where SDMA, NOMA, OMA, uh, all those schemes are actually sub-strategies of rate splitting multiple access. And so there is no need to look at all those different schemes and compare them. Essentially, everything can be tackled under one umbrella, one framework. And because it's a powerful strategy, it also enables us to find low complexity strategies that can provide better performance at the same time, be less complex than uh, some existing schemes like NOMA. Um, and this is a consequence of the fact that rate splitting um, does not, is not bounded uh, by a specific interference management strategy to be either in the regime of treat interference as noise or fully decode interference, but they can try to um, evolve between those regimes. Now, rate splitting leads to changes. Uh, to the physical layer and the MAC layers of communication system, but it's a really underpinning communication strategies uh, that, that can have a huge amount of, uh, of, of applications. Um, and, um, and so to, uh, what are the performance benefits that we have seen? Uh, I talked a lot about rate or spectral efficiency gains, but actually we have seen also a lot of benefits in terms of energy efficiencies. Um, we have seen performance benefit in terms of quality of service and fairness enhancements. We have seen uh, that rate splitting is robust to imperfect CSIT. And with imperfect CSIT, we can have many different sources. We can have quantized feedback, we can have pilot contaminations, uh, channel estimation errors, we can have uh, mobility issues, uh, whether we evolve at low mobility or at high mobility, uh, latency, subband feedback, and so on. Rate splitting can be used to reduce the feedback overhead. Um, rate splitting is robust to hardware impairments, phase noise, RF impairments, and it can cope with any user distributions, whether you have a disparity of channel directions or strength and network load, underloaded and overloaded. And importantly, you can have a complexity reductions compared to other schemes that also rely on SIC like NORMA. So rate splitting and rate splitting multiple access is also a gold mine of research problems for academia and industry. So I talked about some application of rate splitting here, but there are many more. And the entire physical layer and MAC layer of future networks, whether they are cellular, terrestrial, uh, non-terrestrials uh, non like satellite, UAVs, can all rely on a rate splitting framework where we have this, this common and private streams that are decoded to one or multiple users. Um, so rate splitting can play a big role in fundamental limits of, uh, of wireless networks in multi-user, multi-cell, multi-antenna networks, can be seen as a robust interference management strategy, can be used seen as an enabler of a powerful multiple access, rate splitting multiple access to generalize other existing uh, multiple access strategies. Uh, lots of work needs to be done in the physical layer design, modulation, coding, interleaver, receiver design for physical layers. Uh, uh, for, for rate splitting. Um, lots of problems in higher layer as well, cross layer design, scheduling and optimization and generally performance analysis. And then the whole area of implementation and standardization, uh, rate splitting leads to some change into, into the standards. There are some standardization issues related to rate splitting, uh, some control signalings that needs to be uh, designed and some uh, general signalling that needs to, to be done in order to enable rate splitting. Now, there are lots of specific scenarios where rate splitting can have uh, an impact. Uh, coded caching is something that rate splitting can have a big impact. I haven't talked about this. Physical layer security, multi-user MIMO, millimeter wave MIMO, COM coordinated multipoint, wireless information and power transmission, cooperative transmissions, where additionally we can do some form of uh, user relaying. So, for instance, the common streams can be additionally relayed to the other users to further improve the performance. Massive MIMO, uh, relay, cognitive radio, uh, massive IoT deployment, uh, V2X, vehicular 2X uh, communications, 
uh, massive access, massive machine type communications, UAV, satellite networks, cellular networks. Uh, all those uh, emerging scenarios uh, can benefit from rate splitting simply because rate splitting is a fundamental and underpinning uh, communication theoretic strategies that has been shown to be to reach uh, some of the fundamental of wireless networks and also to shown be, to be extremely robust and very agile and very flexible. Um, so how does it fit within uh, beyond 5G and 6G? Well, actually, if we look at the past release of uh, uh, and the whole history of 4G, 5G system design, we see that multi-user MIMO was an important part. COMP was discussed also coordinate multipoints. On the other hand, there's been other study item and work item on multi-user superposed transmission, which is uh, related to NOMA. Other items were about network assisted interference coordination and other uh, working items on uh, broadcast, multicast and unicast. Actually, all those different work items and study items actually study some part of what rate splitting can do. And so all those bits have been studied separately across different work item and study item. They're all linked through a rate splitting framework. They are, can all be tackled by rate splitting. And importantly, the rate splitting can leverage those uh, existing study items. So we can see rate splitting as actually a future uh, extension, future um, technology that can really leverage the existing study item and work item that have been developed in, uh, in, in 5G. So some of the standard issues that have been uh, tackled in 5G can be leveraged uh, as a stepping stone to actually enable rate splitting later on. Now, what is the missing piece in uh, the standardization is really to enable the message split at the transmitter uh, such that we can really have this joint transmitter and receiver coordination we split the messages and the receiver can know that actually messages have been split it and we can leverage it into the receiver design. And this leads to some signaling um, and uh, change into the CSI feedback and the design of the transmission modes and, and so on. So um, I here provide a non-exhaustive list of uh, references. Um, so for those who are interested, please feel free to contact me if you want to have uh, some more details or if you want to have access to uh, the slides. Um, the uh, rate splitting was originally introduced uh, by Han and Kobayashi uh, 40 years ago in these uh, famous papers about the two user interference channel. And this remains to date as the best known achievable schemes for the two user SISO interference channel as uh, discussed in those uh, first two papers. Then uh, in the past few years, rate splitting has become uh, a very powerful schemes, not for the SISO interference channels, but for multi-antenna system and especially multi-antenna broadcast channels. Um, so here we have rate splitting with quantized feedback, right? Um, how rate splitting can be used to tackle quantized feedback. We have a communication magazine here that provides an overview of rate splitting, especially from the perspective of imperfect CSIT. Rate splitting has been studied in massive MIMO here specifically for FDD massive MIMO. Um, rate splitting, the precoder optimization of rate splitting was first uh, investigated in, the, in this paper here from a sum rate uh, perspective and here the DOF of the key user uh, um, rate splitting was also uh, identified and shown to be the optimal ones, the one matching with the outer bound. Um, another form of uh, optimization of rate splitting was done here in this paper about uh, Maxmin. Uh, this is a Maxmin robust uh, design where the uh, CSI uh, modeling is different, is based on this uh, bounded, in, bounded error um, that I have discussed briefly in this uh, in, in, in this tutorial. Rate splitting was studied in multi-group multicast here in this paper and then in, in overloaded transmission with specific application to IoT. Um, in multi-antenna wireless networks where we have more than one transmitter, so typically an interference channel, but equipped with multiple antennas. Uh, this leads to this topological uh, rate splitting. 
Um, MIMO networks with multiple antennas at the receiver. So now we have a MIMO broadcast channel, so we can have a MIMO uh, interference channel. So we have multiple antennas at the receiver and not necessarily the same number of antennas at the receivers. And so here we have a marginal form of rate splitting that can be used that can leverage the multiple antennas at the transmitters and the receivers. Rate splitting for millimeter wave communications, um, the DOF analysis of rate splitting in a two user scenario, uh, the DOF outer bounds. So uh, this is actually the converse that try to find what is the uh, converse on outer bound on on the DOF when we have MISO BC with imperfect CSIT. And interestingly, the outer bound that we get here match the achievable DOF uh, that we have uh, from uh, in here in this paper, for instance, in the general K user scenario. Um, uh, beyond DOF, there's been work on generalized degrees of freedom that actually try to uh, uh, approximate the capacity in a bit more accurate manner beyond uh, degrees of freedom regime. So that try to capture the disparity of channel strength as part of this uh, degrees of freedom framework. Um, Rage splitting has been studied in the uplink as well in this paper. Um, and though the rate splitting here, the motivation to use rate splitting is different from uh, when we use in the down link, um, it provides also benefits on the uplink as discussed in that paper. Now, the optimality of the entire degrees of freedom region is discussed here in this paper. Um, and uh, the uh, uh, rate splitting is shown to provide essentially to achieve the entire uh, optimal uh, degrees of freedom region. Rate splitting to mitigate phase noise and hardware impairment, especially, especially in massive MIMO. Um, rate splitting has been studied also in the context of multiple access and shown that actually the whole literature on rate splitting that has evolved in parallel to the literature on NOMA um, is actually, uh, actually to just to show that actually SDMA and NOMA are just particular instances of uh, rate splitting and rate splitting multiple access. Uh, so the introduction of this paper here is also helpful for readers who are not familiar or wants to have a, a um, broad understanding of the difference between SDMA, NOMA and RSMA. Um, energy efficiency of rate splitting and rate splitting multiple access has been uh, discussed here. Uh, rate splitting with nonlinear recording has been a little bit discussed in this paper. So. Uh, most of the papers deal with linear precoding, so here try to look at the effect of nonlinear precoding. Um, rate splitting in network MIMO or joint uh, transmissions when you have uh, across multiple uh, base stations. Rate splitting in unicast and multicast transmissions. Rate splitting for wireless information and power transmission. Uh, rate analysis of rate splitting and showing uh, analytically how rate splitting can unify different schemes, SDMA, OMA, NOMA, and multicasting. Um, the use of rate splitting in the context of user relaying. And so noticing that the common streams is decoded by both user and can be forward from one user to another user in, a, to, in order to enhance the performance. Uh, an alternative proof of the optimality of uh, rate splitting. So a first proof of the whole DOF region of rates uh, achieved by uh, rate splitting is in this paper. Uh, here we have a, an alternative proof that actually relies on a different uh, approach. Uh, rate splitting with finite constellation has been uh, investigated to some extent in this paper here. Rate splitting in multi-send, multi-group, multicast. So multi-group, multicast was studied before, but here is an extension where we have multi-send as well. Uh, robust, uh, an alternative optimization framework, uh, robust optimization framework of rate splitting. It's been studied here. Um, rate splitting in massive MIMO, but uh, with uh, relay systems in the context of a parallel MISO broadcast channels with partial CSIT, rate splitting plays a role as well. And then in coded caching, rate splitting can play a big role, uh, try to leverage um, the multicast opportunities of coded caching and at the same time leverage the multiplexing gain of the multi-antenna systems. And then uh, marrying rate splitting and dirty paper coding and showing that rate splitting cannot perform dirty paper coding uh, and how to actually marry those two into dirty paper coded rate splitting is studied in that paper. 
Um, now, rate splitting has been studied in multi-group multicast, but also with a common message. Additionally, this has been studied here, or in multi-group multicast, but with a multi-carrier additionally. So, for instance, OFDM. Um, the extension of the cooperative rate splitting that we had here for uh, two users here, this has been extended here in the K user scenario. Um, so rate splitting has been studied from a spectral efficiency and from an energy efficiency perspective here. We try to understand is a trade-off between energy efficiency and spectral efficiency of uh, rate splitting. Um, Pre-coded design where we have uh, multi-antenna receivers in rate splitting. And then rate splitting has been studied for uh, other systems like joint communication and radar, um, and for satellite communication as well in those, uh, those two papers, um, and showed the significant robustness of rate splitting in satellite communications. Rate splitting has been studied in TDD massive MIMO here, and the problem of uh, to mitigate uh, pilot contaminations in cognitive radio, and uh, rate splitting is shown to be a powerful uh, strategy to design the physical layer of uh, 6G in, in this paper here. The first design of the physical layer, modulation coding, adaptive modulation and coding, and the entire receiver design was, uh, along with the link level simulations, was actually uh, first investigated in this paper. Uh, rate splitting in CRAN that connects to this network MIMO I talked about earlier as well, uh, but capturing uh, some um, constraint on the front hole has been studied in those two papers. Uh, some optimality of rate splitting um, um, in, in some specific scenarios have been studied here in these papers. Some additional precoder design for rate splitting has been considered in some more recent papers. And then again, rate splitting with quantized feedback has been studied uh, again uh, in this last paper. So there are other, maybe other papers as well. Um, um, there is an increasing pa number of papers in, in this area recognizing the benefit of rate splitting in uh, many different scenarios and over uh, SDMA and NOMA. And so with this, I uh, finish uh, this tutorial. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if you have interest in this topic. Um, and thank you for uh, listening.